Okay, say, we are these, live. All these readies make me feel nervous. <laughs> well, now we're going. What? Hello. And my computer is screaming. <laughs> is it using... Okay, hopefully it's not using all of that CPU just for the encoding. Holy shit. Hopefully flames aren't jutting out the side of it. Yeah. Settings. I believe the uh, the history of saying that my computer had bugs was literal bugs that were crawling in the old yeah, yeah. IBM machines. Yeah, there was Maybe a, something a moth there. that fell into one of the vacuum tubes or something. <laughs> and it killed the whole thing. And they had to go in there and get oh, the damn. bugs out. They had to debug it. That was the first initial debugging. I love yeah, it. It's amazing. Yeah, I uh, I know in computer history, I think it was the Apple III was the first computer that had to deal with heating issues because it was the first one that actually had so much heat going through it that it became an issue. And they didn't think about how they were going to cool it at the time that they engineered it. So they shipped off a bunch of Apple III's. And when they started bricking, they had to ask tech support, like, what do I do with this? What's going on? The screens are freezing. And tech support pretty much told them to pick up your Apple III, like, an inch or two off the table and drop it. And hopefully that would reseat all the RAM that was popping out. <laughs> oh, I did misspell the title. Hold on. I fixed it. I fixed it. We're good. We're fine. This is fine. This is fine. This is fine. This is fine. Not a fire jetting off in the yeah, background. Yeah, like the, the ocean fine. is on fire like it was that one time in like 2021. One time. <laughs> Well, yeah, when there was like the the oil rig blew up and it looked like a portal to hell. Yeah, you're talking about the BP oil spill. Well, no, okay, that one was way older. But anyway, well, yeah, see, that's what I'm saying. The one time the ocean was on fire, other than the other time the ocean was on fire. <laughs> okay. Uh. Yeah. So we're we're good. We are good. Cool. Well, we're here. If that's our definition, yes. Yes, yes we are okay. Uh. So. It's gonna be all right. We've got Spigs back. He's gonna he's gonna talk about some cool stuff and some not so. Oh, are cool we going? Stuff. Yeah, we're live. <laughs> oh shit! I wanted to do my I wanted to do my vocal exercises first. <laughs> Whatever. Let's let's try it. Let's try it. Yeah, repeat after me. A how now, brown cow? A how now, brown cow? Unique New York. Unique New York. I live in an aluminum anemone condominium complex. I live in an aluminum anemone condominium complex. There we go. I love it. <laughs> nice. I, I can tell you were just fucking with me, but it was still good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, I know it was misspelled. We're fine. This is fine. <laughs> Never going to let you live it down. Okay. What did you misspell? Volunteer was spelled volunteer. It looked like a fucking <laughs> German word, dude. You're German now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Tolton Conference. <laughs> so, here's the plan today. We are going to discuss a lot of things, and one of them is going to be Veterans Day tomorrow because Spigs has some important stuff to say about it. We'll leave I that do? for a little ways. Yes. Yes, you okay. do. Uh, I... For anybody that doesn't know, Azil likes to bother me at least once or twice a week, and he likes to show in like, hey, you got PTSD? You got any trauma? You want to share that with everybody? How about now? How about now? <laughs> I do not. It says dance, monkey, dance from the monetization. <laughs> Jesus. <Great>. <laughs> Gaslighting cat. <laughs> <laughs> cruelty okay so first thing if you want to like reintroduce yourself as what you have done with your life thus far obviously you don't have to give a full recap but like list off some oh, bullet like points. every day and then tuesday i ate a sandwich <laughs> and after there i saw a big bird on the window so like get your people to really drop just keep keep droning on until i can get the viewer count down to one that'd be pretty funny yeah exactly uh yeah sure i can give you a little cap here but uh beforehand uh let's see i uh i was from the the guy that joined the ypg video and uh i just have to make a quick clarification because one of the things that happened in the editing process and it started up right away was that navy seal thing i thought i was address that really really super fast yeah. because when you're dealing with veterans uh one of the things that two of a trade can do is they can sniff each other out very fast to see if someone's bsing them and it came across uh due to a little bit of bad editing there that i i it seemed like i was claiming to be an army seal which doesn't even make sense uh not in the navy have not completed basic underwater demolitions training not a navy seal by any stretch of the imagination uh for the full really quick overview of my military history i was in uh it was 2001 i went to fort knox to become a 19 delta cavalry scout and uh 
friggin i uh I got kicked out due to some stress fractures there. Basically, I was like 135 pounds soaking wet. I uh, I had the friggin' one stripe on my vertical pinstripe pajamas. And what they do is they make you like frickin' ruck around like 100 pounds on your back for the ninth for the cavalry scout uh, ruck marches, which at the end of it, the whole training session goes to 22 kilometers. And you're like, Jesus Christ. And they you go down the heartbreaker hills. And so by the end of it, I had uh, five stress fractures, one in each foot, one in each knee, and a gash that, that hit the right hip that they wanted to throw a frickin' titanium bolt into. And so I got kicked out that first time, and I had to spend five years frickin' swimming to try to wrap uh, about like 220 pounds worth of muscle onto my broken bones and re-enter the army in 2007. And so I uh, then served as I went back into the army uh, between 2007 and 2012 uh, with the 101st Airborne Division, which which is kind of hilarious because the 101st Airborne Division is known as like, oh, you're from the 101st Airborne? Oh, you must like running then. And I'm like, no, that's the opposite thing that I like. I've got a bunch of stress fractures. And it's... Uh, it, it was a weird scenario where I'm like collecting 10% VA disability for being a disabled veteran while in the United States army, uh, going on my deployments. I, uh, I deployed as a part of the 101st two times to Afghanistan, once in 2009 and the other in 2011. Uh, afterwards I got out in 2012 and I went immediately into contract military contracting where I went down to Zabal province, Afghanistan, and there I contracted with the Navy SEALs, teams two and four as part of their special projects group, uh, doing a, a bunch of cool stuff. If you have any questions about the specifics, I'll try to answer them as, as I'm allowed to. Uh, after I got out of that contract, I joined the YPG in 2015, which is where all those those little fun videos are. So uh, I know it sounds like the, at the beginning, Army SEAL, haha, what a, what a, what a faker. Uh, not the case, just a miscommunication on that. Yeah. And I, I know exactly how that feels because I uh, I used to be in like Austin, Texas for a while. And there's like homeless dudes on like every other street corner. And every one of them come up to you and be like, hey, man, spare a dollar. I'm an army veteran. And you're like, oh, really? OK, what uh, what unit were you from? Oh, with the unit with the tanks. And I'm like, mm, that doesn't sound like a unit, buddy. What was your MOS? Was that? And they give you the deer, the headlights look. And they're like, what was your military occupational specialty? What did you do for the United States military? Like, oh, I was a MOS sniper. And you're like, mm, that doesn't that doesn't make sense either. It sounds like you're bullshitting me. Maybe I put a nine millimeter hole in your head. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I get a lot of people that do that annoying fake out uh, stolen valor thing, and it ticks me off too. That's that's the full quickie on that one. I just want to do a little brief overview of that. Yeah. Where, uh, where were we? I don't think we were anywhere. I think you're allowed to go from whatever starting point you want. Oh, rock and roll. Uh, let's see. You asked me how I was doing afterwards. Uh, really quick. Are you okay? <laughs> I'm doing good. It just, okay. It just seems kind of weird because you seem to disappear like a month at a time. And when you come back, it really hits the wall really, really fast. Like, like. Friggin', all right, everybody, we're going to do live chats every single day, and we're going to do a live chat tomorrow and a live chat for that, and then I'm going to drop this, and I've got plushies coming, and i got short animations coming. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, all right, Azil's really pushing it out. And then, like, two weeks later, like, guys, I'm feeling pretty burnt out. I'm going to have to take yeah, a hiatus. I'm not, away from at, one. <laughs> uh, I'm not the best at, like, timing my work, which is why I recently started paying one of my friends to do all my scheduling for me. Uh, Ooh, that's and, secretary. Yeah, so she's helping with Basically, I'll get into a call with someone, talk about what they want to talk about, and then I just tell my friend Zoe, like, yo, can you, like, figure out a time for this and put it on my calendar? And then she does. And it's incredibly okay. helpful. Because to me, it came across as mania, like, really high highs and really low lows. <laughs> like, yes. um, what was the, the movie Oh Polar. Brother, Where Art Thou? Remember when uh, the movie Oh Brother, Art Thou, freaking with George Clooney, and uh, they're walking down the road and baby face George Nelson, the mobster comes driving down the road and dollar bills are flying out of his car. <laughs> and he's like, hurry up, get in. And he's shooting at the police and he's shooting at like cows. And he takes them on a, on a friggin' train, a uh, uh, bank robbery. And he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm George Nelson. And I'm going to break the record for the most 
bank's robbed in a day. And someone mentions like that there's baby face Nelson and is like immediately goes from 11 down to a two. And he's like, you don't, you don't call me that. My name's George Aww. Nelson. And he spends the rest of the time moping and just throwing <laughs> his money into the campfire going, it doesn't matter anyway. <laughs> that was That's you and your schedule. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to deny that. I'm just going to accept that. But I, I think with the with the content that I'm making now, I can probably manage to do with intermittent breaks. I can probably manage to do videos or streams daily for at least mm -hmm. like 80 percent of the time. And I'm starting with doing yeah, them daily for at least two weeks so that I can like get established like, hey, this is what's happening on the channel now. So get excited for that. And as for the plushies, thanks for mentioning that. I've got plushies coming out, like real life ones. Uh, they are available on the merch store, which is pinned at the top of the chat if you would like to get one. They will be available between January and March 2023 is when they're coming out. Uh, they're $30 plus shipping, and I think they ship to most of the developed world. I, mm -hmm. I don't think you can get one in, like, North Africa, but or sub-Saharan Africa, but I'm, you know, other than that. Right. No plushies for the Africans. <clears throat> Racist. Well, when oh, you man, say it weird, like that. It's a weird cough I have there. Where did that come from? <laughs> wow. Wow. I've, uh, I've seen the plushies. They've, uh, they have made in China on the tag. And if you flip the tag over, it says, please help me. I am stuck uh, in a factory in China. <laughs> Oh, I thought we were going to talk about how each of them has a micro camera and microphone in it that connects to public Wi-Fi whenever <laughs> oh, you go to Starbucks. See. Every time you talk about the CCP, it makes a little, like, zoom-in camera noise. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> NFT plushies? Yeah, no. No, thank you. No, thank you. Norway? Yes, they ship to Norway. I'm almost certain. I, I set up international shipping recently. Uh, okay, so... Tell me what has been going on since we last talked, if anything. What's what's been up? Hmm. Well, let's see. I uh, I again attempted to. I, I know I, I mentioned it story time. I tried my best to get into Ukraine, and like, uh, what happened? I I got all my cool stuff. I got my dragon skin body armor, which everybody has an opinion on. Shut up! I don't care. It's great. Uh, I have the the thermals, the FLIR breach. I have the PVS night vision goggles, and I've got the military grade drone it's not like something you go to a brick stores brickstone and uh buy for five six hundred dollars this is a five figure drone that goes 50 miles an hour is completely silent can carry a payload doesn't like talk to the satellites unless you want it to talk to the satellites and when it gets scrambled by guns uh instead of just falling to the earth it just returns back to a preset point it's got geofencing it's an amazing thing and i uh i wanted to bring it to to ukraine because I practiced with it, I practiced with my laser range finder, and me and my buddy were set to go, and we could get like grid square uh, plugged in on an enemy Russian tank in like under 20 seconds, and I had all the equipment to make sure I wasn't talking to the the GLONASS uh, satellite system, which the Russians control. And we had everything ready to go. I had contacts that I had from my YPG buddies that were in Ukraine. They uh, they weren't part of the Ukrainian Foreign Legion. They were part of like the militias that formed around some of the individual towns, and they were going to help me get in. And then. There in the Chicago O'Hare International Airport, uh, as I mentioned in the story time, they tried to take my stuff. Like they, uh, they, they weren't expecting a bribe so much as they wanted to steal my things. Like they had, um, they had like a five-hour window from when I came in and we met and going like, yeah, everything's all clear, everything looks good, to the very part of where I'm on the plane itself, where they yank me out of the plane and they're like. Oh man, you know, where's your ITAR license? Where's this license? Where's that? And we got into an argument concerning the legal ramifications of the export of various military armaments. And then they're like, "Well, we can let you go to uh, to Ukraine or to Poland to get to Ukraine, but we're gonna have to take all of your stuff." And it's like, "Dude, f you! This is like this is all I have. You're gonna send me shirtless to Ukraine. Uh, I hate you." And I ended up freaking just going back. And after that event. Uh, going back home and after that event i uh we had tried to put in a report with the inspector general going what's on what's going on here your uh, your agents are not obeying the laws that you have set forth uh concerning international trains and art regulations because basically the uh the definition of uh of what kind of armaments you can bring overseas 
is that you can bring individual stuff for yourself, but you need a special license if your intention is to export a multitude and sell those. And so like having my own personal body armor and things of that nature shouldn't fall under it. It's, a, it's an incredibly obnoxiously bureaucratic and complicated system because you have multiple uh, schools or multiple government organizations that have their hand in the pie wanting to be bribed for the license. You got the Department of State, the Department of Transportation, the Department of Commerce, uh, the Department of Defense, and they're all like, we have our own rules and they don't talk to each other. And you also have like senators that don't know how it works. Like the actual lawmakers don't know how their laws work and they bring in experts that are supposed to know how it works and they don't know how it works. So it comes to the individual interpretation of those agents at borders and customs and border control and homeland security. And I sent the inspector general report in, what are your guys doing? I haven't heard back from them since. And uh, I think I'm going to have to end up dropping that anyway, because I want to, I've got to get an ITAR license as part of this Hyperion gun company, which I'm becoming a part of. Uh, I'm in uh, basically I'm in a machine shop right now. I'm working two part-time jobs. And some guy wants to get up on the ground floors of an armament company. Uh, I'm a machinist and a tool and die person by trade. And he wants to make guns. And it's like, well, okay, I can't simultaneously have the government really mad at me because I'm, I'm peeking into business and getting people in trouble and also begging them for the license uh, to allow me to legally create firearms. So that's probably going to get dropped. And that's where that stupid thing went. Uh, it really sucks because uh, when Ukraine first started up, they were taking anybody like when the first month or two of Ukraine, they were letting prisoners out of jail because the Russians were coming. They had what, like a 20 kilometer tank convoy coming right to Kiev and there weren't enough people there. They were like losing ground like crazy. And then all of a sudden, like they had plenty of people. <laughs> first off, they were begging for anybody. So they took anybody, whether they had military experience or not. And so they tried to arm them up and train them up. And by the time they armed them up and trained them up, they had received like one one painful missile strike or they'd gotten into combat and they're like, whoa, this is not for me. You have a nice day. So it seemed like a huge waste of time and resources for them. So that made hiring for the Ukrainian Foreign Legion look pretty bad. And then they had the situation where they got pretty much all the military age males in Ukraine to go fight. And now they just need the arms, which they've been asking for forever. Now they just need the weapons. They have the bodies. So... If I don't show up with my own armaments and my own supplies ready to go, ready to be plugged into the system, you're pretty much not going to be lit in. You're going to be you're not, you're, you're gonna be lit in. Exactly. <laughs> you, you, you could probably get into the country, but you're not going to be officially sponsored by the Ukrainian Foreign Legion. You're just going to be some rando out there. And I wanted this time to like, hey, I've done this before. Now I'd like to do it with night vision and thermals and the ability to really fight and make a difference. And uh, the, the stupid Chicago people. I hate Chicago. I hate the whole state of Illinois. It's just, ah, what a corrupt, awful state. So that's, uh, that's where that went. Yeah, and that really sucked because uh, the first month I was slated to go, but I wanted to finish up. I wanted to wrap up my tool and die degree. And I, I went immediately to the, what is it, the embassy, the Ukrainian embassy in Chicago and put in my paperwork and said, like, I'm here if you need me. You give me a call, et cetera. And just it was it was so chaotic at the time. You had to wait in a line of like 20 people that would be going up to the to the consulate and crying going can you get this out can you contact this person this poor consulate going i don't know i just <laughs> i just came in for breakfast i don't know what has happening i can't get your kids out of ukraine what do you want from me yeah and we actually had a number of volunteers there it was kind of cool but uh, in the end it looked like it it kind of ended up going nowhere that sucks mm. yeah i've been looking into potentially taking on uh refugees uh a friend of mine as a refugee in America, but it's like, there's so much going on and I found a lawyer that'll do it, but it's like $3,000 nice. for the whole process. It's ridiculous. <laughs> not, uh, the lawyer isn't doing it for humanitarian. Purposes. No, absolutely not. <laughs> Are you saying that I can't get a lawyer? That's a humanitarian. Oh man. Who would have guessed? I thought Almost that's what lawyers were trained to know exactly how to use all technicalities against humanitarian causes. And if absolutely necessary, mm -hmm. To extract profit for themselves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yep, yep, yep. Any particular questions, or do you want me to finally talk about PTSD since you've been bugging me about that for half a year? <laughs> you know what? Let's let's do that early. So absolutely, you have the floor for that. Oh, okay. Sweet, 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 sweet. So uh, let's see. In honor of Veterans Day, let's talk about 
post-traumatic stress disorder, at least the military version of post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, I guess the, the first thing to, to do would be to define what it isn't. Uh, I know a lot of people in the military that have TBI or traumatic brain injury. And that's a, that's a medical condition basically where like you were in a convoy and you tripped over an IED and an explosion happened and the shockwave hit you so hard that it rattled your skull, your brain inside your skull. And I know a couple of people like that and like goop is coming out of the ears. They have like cranial fluids that come out of the ears. They get an immediate stutter. Uh, they had TBI tests before you went in on your deployment and then after your deployment to see if your reaction speeds and everything change. And that one, uh, yeah, that's totally different than the PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder thing where people have a trigger and they have a trauma and it causes them uh, emotional distress and things that are affecting their lives in that way. So it is good to differentiate between the two. Uh, other particulars, let's see. I think we want to be. I think we want to be nuanced when we're talking about it. And one school of thought about army PTSD is that it's all bullshit. Like that's one school of thought because there are a lot. And the evidence for that that a lot of people point to is that there are so profoundly many soldiers that are gaming the system and they're faking PTSD in order to get a lot of money. Uh, basically you get out of the, the army, uh, you, you're, or are getting out of the army and you've spent your whole life, like as an infantryman, or you've spent your whole life with something that does not have a civilian equivalent and a job waiting for you that you're going to be able to get into. And so you, and it's, it's been tough, man. It's been tough as a veteran getting into the job market because what you get all the time is like your time in the service. Well, it's not accredited in accordance with this credit and that credit and this certification and that certification. And the people hiring you don't understand uh, what you are and are not capable of. So you'll get people that were like battlefield medics that saved people's lives by uh, putting on a tourniquet or friggin' popping a straw into their neck and keeping them breathing in a battlefield scenario. And they're not qualified to be an EMT or they're not qualified to be a nurse. They have to start that whole process over again because they don't follow like state guidelines and just asinine things like that. And so the job market's tough for that reason. Uh, the other reason the job market's tough and it's really obnoxious is that people will always thank you for the service. Thank you for your service. We're a very veteran friendly uh, company. And then three or four days will go by and they're like, we've decided to go with a better quality, more qualified candidate. Have a nice day. And that's that every freaking employer just wants work experience. They don't give a crap about, they don't give a crap about education. And the only thing the VA helps you with is education. And it's like, call, no one cares about college anymore. No, I, I got five degrees. Nobody gives a shit. Yeah. It's like, yeah, d degree certification is nothing. Companies just want, how can you make me money right now without me having to train you or think about you in any way, shape, or form? How do I plug you into my system and extract wealth from you immediately? And you're like, crud. So a lot of veterans don't have anything else they can do. And when you're getting out, somebody comes with a little checklist and they're like, hey, do you feel bad? And they're like, yeah, I feel bad. I feel bad about a lot of things. Cool. Say these words, check this box. And we will put you in the process for the VA of getting you benefit, your benefits. And a lot of people go down the route of the PTSD thing because it's, it's an incredibly subjective condition that's very hard to prove that you do not have it. And because the, the bureaucrats in charge of the VA have to go through a, a, almost like a checklist of words and issues a lot of people are looking up online, like, what are the words I have to say? What are the things, the check marks I have to do in this sheet of paper and write it out so that they cannot disqualify it for me? And so you get a lot of people that are like, they're getting this, despite the fact that they're perfectly fine health wise, they'll be getting like a 3000 to $5,000 check in the mail for the rest of their life. And there's nothing that's stopping that. Yeah. So, and I know it's anecdotal, but I know like, I would say out of all the people I know that have PTSD, maybe one in five actually have it. It's a very bad ratio from, from what I can see. Um, I, I cannot say that, well, first of all, I can't blame them for doing it. It, it feels sometimes like this, this country's collapsing. And I guess the thought process is if the Titanic is going down anyway, what's the big problem with stealing the furniture? 
Mm. <laughs> it's uh, you, you go on these deployments and you work these 16 hour days doing complicated, dangerous, dem physically demanding things. Like you're not an idiot. You're repairing missile systems and you're keeping satellites in space and you're taking small arms fire and you're really pushing your body and yourself to the limit and you're putting yourself in danger. And by the end of the year, you get like $20,000. It's pathetic. You get like less than Burger King money. And like a lot of veterans will tell me, I was like, man, I could spend five to 10 years in the United States military and I would not make enough money to buy one of Nancy Pelosi's super mega million dollar sub zero refrigerators full of artisanal ice cream. I'm going to try to get what I can out of the system because everybody else is. I don't want to be the only sucker that's not taking it from the system. Right. Uh, there's, I, I definitely can vouch that there is such a thing as PTSD. The idea that it's all bullshit is completely wrong. Because I've got a friend, uh, let's call him Private J, who, he was, in, uh, he was in Konar province, Afghanistan. He was a guardsman, and he was on convoy inside of his MRAP, his mine-resistant, armor-plated uh, troop carrier, troop transport. And he hit an IED, and it flipped it over, and it was part of a complex attack. And that's where the Taliban will blow you up and then they'll all just be on top of the mountainside rocking you with RPGs and small arms fire. And it flipped his MRAP and a sandstorm had, had started at about that time. And he was stuck in a sandstorm, flipped over without any ability to really fight back as the Taliban were laying into him with RPGs and small arms fire, almost trying to like crack this tin can open and get to the delicious soldier meats inside. And because of the sandstorm, the, he wasn't able to get air support, which is usually what a lot of the, the convoys depend on in case a complex attack lasts for an extensive period of time. So he, uh, he made it out just fine. Uh, there's no physical damage to him. But what happens is now that he's back in the United States, uh, back in the civilian world, whenever there's a really heavy rain or a really heavy snowfall, he, uh, he freaks out like he... He, has, he starts hyperventilating. He has to pull his car to the side of the road, and he has to just kind of sit there giving the, the white-knuckle grip on the, on the steering wheel. Uh, and I know he's not faking it because, well, one, because we're not nice to him about it. We make fun of him for it. Like, you bitch, let's go, because we're you know, a bunch of veterans. And, uh, and also, I know he's not faking it because he doesn't collect PTSD money. Like, he refuses to go to the VA. He doesn't want to go to the VA because uh, he thinks he'll be part of those annoying uh, subjective red flag laws, which are getting worse and worse every year. And he thinks that if he goes to the VA, he'll be logged into that system and the government will eventually come and take his guns. And so his decision is like, I, guns are a big part of my life. I don't want to be vulnerable. And I'm not giving up my guns for a paycheck from the government. I'm able to sustain myself just fine uh, working, working in the area. So I, there's like living proof that not all military PTSD is BS. So yeah. that's, yeah, that's one thing that we have to remember when we're talking about PTSD. Uh, let's see. Another thing to remember about PTSD is that a lot of people are crazy before they join the army. <laughs> I think you have to be a little crazy before you get into the army. Uh, I think Generation Kill put it the best way. Uh, not the HBO miniseries, but the, the book by the Rolling Stones uh, journalist. And he, uh, he noted that all the rank and file people that are actually fighting America's wars on the front line, they, uh, they're pretty much America's lost disposable generation of children. These are, the, these are the kids that come from broken homes. Half the people in a lot of these platoons have single working absentee family members and so they'll come home latchkey in hand and they're pretty much raised by a television set uh a lot of soldiers and marines and frontline fighters are raised by they're they're on more intimate terms with video games and anime and internet pornography than they are with their own family and uh that's the people that you tend to get into that and it's the it they that's kind of what you want in a soldier in a way because there's a there's a sociopathy that you want in your killers and they do a good job 
Ah, man, this is this is really difficult to describe. Let's see here. It's not healthy, but it functions for the screwed up goal. It does, and it's it's what you want because I knew a lot of people in the army that were um that were kind of these suburbanite people that have always been living their life on a, like a fluffy cloud, and when they finally got to their deployments, they would take like one zinger around them and then they would be they would freak right the hell out despite the fact that they're in like eight thousand dollar iotv body armor and they run to their half million dollar mrap and all of a sudden they're behind their remote control crow's nest and they'll blow an entire village to pieces friggin' freaking out uh with this thing and then fucking they'll they'll get out of the army and they'll go home and they'll collect ptsd and they'll cry about it and then they'll freaking uh they'll write they'll get on facebook and they'll write poetry about how hard it is to be the sheepdog it's ridiculous and i think you need those kind of cold killers that just it's not a big deal that are able to keep their cool in those scenarios isn't that kind of what you want not only your soldiers but like your police officers police officers that don't freak out in violent dangerous scenarios right and then the yeah, downside so, of that they, go ahead Oh, yeah, because when they they aren't scared of everything, they don't go in and immediately shoot your dog. <laughs> they yeah. know how to handle themselves. And a lot of people that come from broken homes, they they can handle themselves in more tense situations than usually from the kinder homes. Uh, but the only difficulty that a lot of them are uh, displaying signs of PTSD from their home situation before they joined the army in during their deployments and that the things on the deployments in the military are, are exacerbating those things which were initially there yeah you were you were saying uh of course the downside to having these efficient killers as the people in charge of keeping mental health services for instance in the case of the police like those efficient killers and fighters are also deciding who gets to go to a mental hospital and who gets arrested and thrown in jail. And that's when it goes really wrong. Hmm. I could see it, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What else do we have to consider when we're actually talking about PTSD? There's, um, hmm. There's kind of a, a, people think of PTSD like it's, that's that guy's veteran Bob over there. And he saw somebody die and he saw a violent thing. And now he's mopey and we just got to hand him a check and make him go away and hand it and then pop some pills and make him go away. And it was just that one traumatic thing that happened to him. But it's like, there's, there's an infinitely deeper issue going on here. And I, I, I want to get to it, but I have to kind of go on a tangent to kind of explain it. So, I'm going to rock a little tangent here and you're going to have to try to keep with me because it's kind of complicated, but I'm going to give it a shot here. I flipping hate McDonald's. I think McDonald's is the grossest, worst restaurant I've ever seen. You go into a McDonald's and it's like, it's like they're wafer thin meats, 30% sawdust. It's like, the, the sponge bread was made out of a test tube. It hasn't been part of a natural grain that came out of the ground ever. The McDonald's Sprite is like something that comes that you can get your Geiger counter to tick on. You put a friggin' light bulb in a McDonald's Sprite and it just lights up and you're like, oh my god, are you putting this into your body? <laughs> and uh, friggin' no, nobody who wants, who nobody really wants to be at a McDonald's. Like something wrong has happened in your life to get you there. You're like in between your third or fourth job and you've got five seconds on the clock and only two cents in your pocket. So you give up and you go to the McDonald's drive through and frickin' uh, yeah, nobody wants to go there. Nobody wants to work there either. Like something again, unless you're in high school or something, you're like, man, Mc something wrong has happened in my life that I'm working in a McDonald's. There's a reason that everybody there is high off their gourd because I would be too. And nobody even wants to own a McDonald's. Like the kind of people that, they're just people that want to make a lot of money really fast and easy and guaranteed. They're not the kind of people that, get out of the culinary institute and they have dreams of making Gordon Ramsay really proud. They're the kind of people that are like, I just want to own a real franchise, a turnkey business that I can completely ignore. Uh, how am I going to do that? 
I'm going to go for a McDonald's. And so how did this abominable, stupid building get all over the nation? Why is it stamped out everywhere in the same gross urban sprawl next to the Shell, same Shell gas station, next to the same freaking Hobby Lobby indefinitely? And the answer to why we have this awful business is because it was easy and it was cowardice. It was basically a person that says, I don't want to take an actual financial risk creating a good restaurant. I'm going to go get a very easy loan at the bank. And the bank already has the pre-paperwork out because they're like, oh, you're opening up a McDonald's? Of course here. We already have the paperwork pre-done, pre-stamped. Here's your McDonald's loan. It's corporatized. The only thing McDonald's corporate does, it's more of a real estate company. They just scout locations that they know they can sell their over-salted crack cocaine for your lizard brain for that they know is going to make a lot of money. And so you have something that should have been good, should have been a nice community-based ma and pa family store. Uh, that brings healthy food to people. Instead, you have a McDonald's. That's what's wrong with that. What's, what's wrong with modern architecture? You see everything being the same box building over and over again. It's not like the old 1950s where it's a beautiful Art Deco style. They had the concept back in the past that the the community, the buildings were kind of owned by everybody, that this was a communal thing. Instead, it's like, no, it's just stamped out prefab box again urban sprawling forever and the reason for that is you had a boring coward in a suit that got their masters of business associate and they say we could save a lot of money doing this this is the practical thing to do we can't spend money and waste money on something like that that's endangering our business model I'm like shit that's what's wrong with architecture that's wrong with mcdonald's why did the video game industry collapse you have Nothing nowadays, but the same sequel over and over and over again. You've got loot boxes and microtransactions, and you've got frickin' uh, seasonal battle passes squirting out the least quantity of content possible while maximizing addictions and Skinner box-level stuff to make awful games. And it's because all those people that used to make beautiful games 10, 20 years ago now aren't the people in charge. The people in charge are cowardly, middle management, MBAs, masters of business associates in nice suits. Those are the people running your favorite game companies, accountants, business managers, lawyers, over and over again. And it's like, why is, why is the film industry suck? Why is it subject to sequelitis? Why is it so bad that I have to watch another live action Disney sequel to Aladdin in this gross factory process thing that again no artist worth his salt wants to write for it nobody wants to act in it because a lawyer said well we'll lose the rights if we don't do this it's practical they do the cowardly thing that guarantees lots of money and that their own personal career will will flourish even at the cost of the company even at the cost of the final product i was like why am i why am i ranting and raving about mcdonald's and film factory film and video games and architecture etc etc because i'm establishing this this pattern that these there's selfish people useless selfish people in suits that are turning everything into a business and that's what happened with the military industrial complex you have the the war isn't run by warriors anymore the war isn't run by your patent esque figure or, or, or people that have been fighting all their lives or know any better. You talk to any general at a West Point, they sound like they just graduated from a from a business friggin' with a business degree. They sound like they come out with that exact same corpo zombie speak. They um this this leadership class is incredibly risk adverse. It's all about their careers, and it drives me up the wall because I, I think about the, our our twenty years on the war on terror. And I think about all the things that very, very easily that could have been done, that could have been changed, that would have been better. And it was a guy in a suit telling me, no, that's impractical. I'm not going to endanger my career about that. I'm going to do the cowardly thing and I'm just going to toe the line and I'm not going to make a change. Let me think about some of the things that happened in Afghanistan that were consistent. Uh, We had had mortar strikes on base all the time. We had these far-flung outposts where... 
what a terrorist would do is he would usually set a mortar on an egg timer or a chemical timer. He would lay it up against a rock and he would walk away. And two hours later, it would explode and it would send a mortar to, to kill some of the soldiers on the base. And you're like, okay, let's brainstorm about how we can stop that. How do we, how do we prevent this tactic? Well, we can mine the area. And next time they go to set up a, mor a mortar, they just, they just blow up. But maybe you're saying there's kids in the area or something like that. So let's not do that. Let's, let's just put a sniper out there. Let's have a sniper guarding the area, doing overwatch on the area. And if a man shows up with a cylinder at two in the morning, you just pop his skull off. Problem solved. And some of the Marine far-flung bases actually did this. But I think even that stopped. And none of the Army guys wanted to do it. Because, again, a, a risk-adverse commander was all like, nah, if that sniper gets killed, then that's on me. But if a mortar that I couldn't have prevented anyway kills you, that's not on me. So I'm going to go ahead and not change tactics. Or we had situations in Afghanistan where, uh, I don't know, we, we, had, um, we had checkpoints. Illegal Taliban, Hezbollah, uh, Baden, uh, Haqqani Network checkpoints that after we passed through the area, they would cobble it together and they would stop people on the roads and they would hit them up for cash. But most importantly, they would pretty much be laying down like, hey, we control this road. We're the guys in control of this area. Not those Americans. They're just going to drive off and go hide in their base. We're the ones that really own this area. So it's like, well, we're adding legitimacy to the terrorists. How do we stop this tactic? And I always thought, why don't we just, um, for brainstorming purposes, why don't we just uh, file 20 freaking soldiers into a jingle truck like a civilian jingle truck and next time it's randomly stopped at one of these illegal checkpoints we all pile out and shoot them like <laughs> that seems like it would work pretty well to me and the commander would be like no that's dumb that could be dangerous and it's like freaking yeah that's that's what war is it's dangers it's putting your soldiers in danger to accomplish the mission but the commanders and the people that were in charge were like no nope, that's gonna be on me if it looks bad you starting to see a pattern about like what's happening here. Yeah. You there. Yeah. I'm yeah. getting it. <laughs> and, uh, friggin, you could just, you could go again and again and again. Let me, let me try to think of other things that happened. We had, here's a, here's one of the major issues that was always kind of interesting concerning the war on terror. The terrorists always said Americans own all the watches, but we have all the time. And what they were doing is they were always waiting us out because they knew that we didn't want to stay. And it was an inevitability that we would deliver Afghanistan to the to the local government who was supposed to protect it. But they weren't going to protect it because they didn't want to die for a corrupt uh, Karzai government that was just a puppet state for the West anyway. So how do we not leave but leave? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I was like, you know, there is actually a historical precedence, a tactic that would work. Why don't we pay, and it sounds crazy at first until you think about it, why don't we pay soldiers and Marines $5 million to stay in Afghanistan? What if I paid you $5 million, $10 million, some very large amount, and you just agree that you're going to set up an outpost and this is your home from now on? And I know, like, thousands of i bet a bunch of veterans would be all aboard on that you got a lot of veterans living out of boxes living in their cars that have nothing else going for them you got other people that are like yeah set me up i do the things i could do with that kind of money i'd be my own little king and what you would produce is your own little fiefdom that is entirely loyal to america that shares the american culture and the language of the culture and the taliban wouldn't be able to do anything about that because these guys are not leaving <laughs> they wouldn't be able to yeah but and it would be incredibly cost effective too. I uh, I know it's uh, anecdotal again, but I heard some. It's always some crazy number. Like we have spent thirty four million dollars per second fighting the war on terror. I'm pretty sure that like this particular tactic would be amazingly cost effective. Uh, and uh, again, it's what they used to do in ancient times too. When you conquered a civilization and you run into a civilization, you put your own actual people and you uproot them from some of your civilization to theirs, so that it it spreads out and they know that you're not going anywhere. But uh, nobody, no commander with a that cares about their career at all or cares about advancement is ever going to say a tactic like that. That's insane. So I always thought for a while, like, well, this is the commander's problem. 
This is those people in leadership, those evil CEOs, those evil accountants, those evil masters of business associates that don't produce anything or don't make anything in the world better, but just manipulate currency. Uh, those generals, they're the evil people and we're the good people. And they're the bad people and I'm the, I'm the great people. I'm the victim and they're the oppressors. And as soon as we hang them all by the neck until they're dead, then I can have the power. I mean, we can have the power, right? <laughs> and then I will usher in the great utopia. And that's, um, I, obviously, that's really naive and stupid. I had to ask myself, like, what's, what's really going on here? And it's not their fault, per se, because if you had commanders that wanted to do the right thing, they found themselves in a system where they would not be promoted. They would not be moved into positions of power where they could make said decisions. The only people that ever got to positions of power were usually corporate speaking yes men that were incentivized to keep the norm going and, and sell all the politicians that landed that progress is being made. 10, 15, 20 years later, they were giving out the exact same message. Coin counterinsurgency tactics are be progress is being made. We're training the locals really well, and they're definitely not going to ditch all the weapons and immediately give them to the Taliban. Progress is being made. It was just like 20 years of lies. And it was it was this awful system that was producing it. I um hmm. This is this is really almost beyond my ability to explain it again. It's, it is the system. It's a gross machine, but it's essentially leaderless. Like you almost think that this level of evil would be some sort of Illuminati conspiracy to keep the war on terror going as long as possible. But I think it's more like uh, what Alan Moore was quoted as saying. You wish, you wish that there was an Illuminati or a Pentavariate or a bunch of gray aliens or lizard aliens that were secretly running the show because the true horror of it is that nobody's in control, that it's rudderless, aimless, leaderless, and without, without a vision, without all of us on the same page in some like we all got to do it together. This is the great war. This is this is the the manifest destiny and you and I as brothers are going to make the world a better place together because we have a plan. Without that in place, we all just default to an every man for himself scenario. And we have what we have emerging from this as the military industrial complex when everyone's will is obstructed, what is emerging is something that nobody really wills. None of the generals want to lose. None of the generals and all the people in charge want like us to all want young soldiers to die. But what comes out of it is this gross machine that friggin' turns lost children into carnival ducks bouncing from fob to fob as insurgent IED practice in order to protect the national ego and uphold the illusory power of the petrodollar. And frickin', I don't know, I almost, I, I begin to see not just the military industrial complex, but what you and I are born into this not the republic, the representative republic or democracy that our forefathers may have wanted, but instead this corp, corrupt, corpro, crony, capitalistic beast, like this creature almost out of the book of revelations that's faceless, leaderless, and it, it's like it's made of clay and iron. It's like it's, how do I describe this? It's indescribable in its complexity it's maddening in its scope and it's it's doesn't it's cruel but it doesn't indifferent it's indifferent in its cruelty to what it does and out of this 
this creature from its freaking branch-like horns are dropping all the soldiers they're falling off of it into the ground like the freaking afghans from the landing gear of the last plane out of Kabul, and this this awful freaking thing that nobody willed and nobody's in control of is stepping on them on the ground and lapping up their lives and regurgitating it onto the people that's on its back which are the the ceos and the freaking generals that are drinking this and laughing and out of the mouth of this creature is just the words feed the rich and kill the poor what one day's wages for a loaf of bread and don't touch my oil and wine and i can't even blame the people that are on the back of this system because they're not even in control of it they're slaves to it it's like um it's like what al pacino said in in freaking what is it the devil's advocate you create coliseums to the ego or what is it you create coliseums to the ego you fiber optically connect everybody to every wanton greedy desire and gold-plated fantasy until everybody becomes their own emperor and becomes their own little god and the party keeps going and then you can't stop it and your eyes are bloodshot and your stomach is full and your dong is sore and you're begging for help but nobody's answering that's those people on the back and it shows that you either have to be the slave of the corpo crony system or you're going to be its food and that's the two choices you have and when all of your friends got eaten by this thing i think you can begin to understand the concept of an existential ptsd it's way deeper than just I saw some violent thing. I'm scared. I'm going to pop a pill. I'm going to take some opioids. It's this, this thing that as you try to fathom it, as you wonder what I can do about it, you're, you find yourself awake at like two or three in the morning at night with your jaw locked backwards and some silent scream fucking flaring out and attacking things that aren't even there anymore you're like this this character from from dark souls or from a from software game where your madness meter is increasing and you've got you've got a pill jar right across from you of fucking what is what is this medication procezine i think i can't see it and if you just take the pills take the opioids it'll all go away but it won't go away because you know the problem is still there you may medicate your way out of it but you're just blinding yourself to the problem of it. You're not solving the problem of it, but you can't solve the problem of it, even if you wanted to. And there's a powerlessness to it. And there's a, an impotent rage that fills all night long. You're not getting any goddamn sleep. That's PTSD. Any, uh, any concerns, comments, questions, complaints? Fucking hell. <laughs> Fucking hell. Yeah, so you were asking about PTSD. And yeah, that's I, I think that's the best descriptor I could give to that. Yeah. So a little elucidation for the uh for the veterans holiday coming up. Yeah. Yeah. Go to Golden Corral. Get your uh go get your free entree. Go get ten percent off of your frickin' basket over at the Red Lobster. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think there's any way out of this? Any way to fix it? Let's see here. Yeah, I bet I bet it really came out as a Debbie Downer here, huh? We kind of left us at a bit of a low note. Okay. Um, I do and I don't. Um, hmm. How to get into this? This is again like scratching my beard for like my ability to to communicate complex topics. But I guess I'll try. And the first thing I would say about just trauma in general is um i guess the question has to be asked do you want do you want to wallow in it do you want to feel bad do you want to be I, I i'm sure we're not maybe jordan peterson fans here i mean i like him i think as a very intelligent person he uh 
he was quoted as saying, and I thought this was pretty apt, that people are always, or a lot of people are always looking for an excuse to be corrupted. You want to lie, you want to cheat, you want to steal, because it's easier to lie than to face the consequences of telling the truth. It's easier to steal than to work hard uh, for the said thing. But you can't just do it. You have to find a psychological self-justification to have that happen. And when trauma comes into your life, because inevitably as a human being, trauma is going to come into everybody's life in one shape or another, a lot of people latch on to that. And they say, finally, this is the justification for exactly what I was looking for. And there's a lot of people in life that become corrupt because it's so hard not to be, to really, to really try under the weight of that beast of revelations that I'm talking about. And you'll see them everywhere. Just go into any Walmart at any part of the freaking country. What are you going to see? You're going to see somebody in two rascal scooters, one cheek in each one. They're going to be freaking pulling. They're going to be eating hot dogs straight out of the refrigerator cold in the middle of aisle six. You're going to be seeing like meth addict ladies with Tweety Bird tattoos on their necks, pulling around screeching children and yelling at them in public. And you're like, oh my God. These people were someone's daughter. This was someone's son once. What happened here? And you want to stop them and be like, hey, I'm going to exercise you. I'm going to kidnap you and we're going to go to the gym and we're going to solve what's happened here. Or I'm going to take you to a drug rehab center. Something wrong has happened in your life. And they'll justify it. Their thing isn't, they don't look at you and they're like, yeah, I know. I should really try harder. I let myself go. This happened and that happened. They don't say that. What they say is the kind of response you get out of Jerry Springer episodes. You don't know me. You don't know what I've been through. You don't tell me what to do. This happened in my life. And it could be legitimate or it could be illegitimate. You could say, like, it could be a real awful horror. You got locked in the closet with Uncle Bad Touch. Or it could be illegitimate. You got people out there that are like, when I was a kid, I opened up a booster pack of Pokemon cards and I didn't get the I didn't get the foil Charizard I demanded, and that's why I'm a serial killer at age 40. And you're like, oh my God. This, there's always psychological self-justification. It's easier to do. So you really have to actually legitimately ask yourself, do you want to get better? Do you want to be an ang- a victim? We we do live a, a, in kind of a society that that conflates victimhood with heroism sometimes and freaking if you're the victim you get all the attention if this bad thing happened to you you're justified in doing what you don't want or in le- in leading an easier life and how does the old saying go if you teach a man out of if you give a man a fish he'll eat for a day if you teach a man to fish he'll eat for a lifetime but if the man doesn't want to fish and he only wants to go smoke crack cocaine in the back of the taco bell There is nothing you can do for him. That's the first question. Do you want to stop smoking crack cocaine in the back of the Taco Bell? And if you do, then there are actually a lot of really good tool sets you can use to pull yourself out of that depressed state, to pull yourself out of like the victimhood, to stop popping the pills whether they've been assigned to you by the va or there's something that you're just taking from the guy in the hoodie down on the street corner and i guess toolbox number one i guess this is my favorite tool would be perspective tool number one is perspective when um when i was a human intelligence collector and interrogator in the bagram theater internment facility i interrogated a guy who he only had one arm. He only had one good working eye. He had, uh, he had been paid by the Taliban to emplace an IED. And he got caught by the thermal cams, and he got obliterated by the gun on an Apache helicopter. It took an enormous chunk out of his body. And later, he was, yeah, of course, he was given medical treatment, but then he was just thrown right in the Bagram internment facility, one of the, one of the worst jails that we operated for a, for a long period of years throughout the War on Terror. And that man's life, like, hard would be a real understatement, man. His, he would sit, if he's lucky, he's in the public cage, which was covered in razor wire and things of that nature. But if he was unlucky, he would be in the isolation chambers 
And the only thing he would do is once every three or four months, he'd get pulled out to be interrogated by people like me, who at the time, like that was just for junior interrogators to kind of cut their teeth. That guy had no information of any value, like any information that was actionable was gone a long time ago, probably like two days after the point of capture. So he just gets pulled out and prodded with inane questions over and over again for years. Who are you working for? Who do you know? What village do you come from? And it, because he was a training dummy for interrogators. And you're like, wow, this guy lives an awful life. How much money did the Taliban pay this guy to take the risk of the worst possible life? Can you guess? How much? It was $10. Ten, <laughs> Ten American dollars was enough to make this man try for that. And I'm like, shit, no matter how bad my life is, <laughs> like, I'm, I've got a VR helmet on. I'm in an air-conditioned room. I have easy access to calories. <laughs> I, have, I, have a, I have two wonderful cats. Things aren't that bad. <laughs> Yeah, and oh God, what what is it? There are uh, there are roughly how many billion people on the on the Earth right now? There's like Thank seven eight. billion, eight billion. Yeah, there's like eight billion of us right now, and I hear I heard that there are as many people alive now as there have ever existed on Earth. So that gives us sixteen billion people throughout the past, throughout history. You and I sitting like floating around in this lovely space probably are in the top billion in terms of quality of life i'll do you one better and i think the number over the history of humanity is around over a hundred billion mm -hmm. mm, okay uh well then if there's a hundred billion and you're talking about the kind of people that like never knew what it was to have central heating never knew how, what it was to like not go hungry i think you and i are doing pretty good yeah and that just that denotes a gratitude that I'm like, man, I am so I'm 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 stoked. I may not be the top, 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 top people. I may not be Elon Musk. I may not be Jeff Bezos, but I'm doing if I look down on the pyramid, I've got a lot to be thankful for. So I think when you're digging yourself out of the trauma hole, the PTSD hole, perspective and gratitude is a pretty good tool. Mm -hmm. Um Tool number two to combat PTSD. Let me think here. Um, I would go with kind of duty would be one of them. You, are, you do suffer a lot of bad things. We all do as people. But so did our ancestors. So did all the people that came before us who freaking died taking D-Day, who froze in Valley Forge to create this opportunity for us to do the best we can. And I think not only do we owe it to the people in the past, but we have a duty and a responsibility to the people that come after us to make the best possible world we can for them. For I guess would be, what comes after Gen Z? I don't even know. Gen I don't want to know. Something. <laughs> yeah, touche. Uh, let's see. So we owe it to them. There's a sense of duty there, and that might be able to get you out of your couch lock that uh, that depression and anxiety and things hit you with. Uh, a third tool is to understand that maybe a little bit of trauma isn't that bad. Like, I'm not saying, like, let's all just go stab ourselves in the eye socket and have horrible things happen to us. But what I'm trying to say is maybe a little bit of push and bad things is a good thing because we can derive growth from that. There wouldn't be a Batman if he didn't lose his parents. There, there are a lot of people on this planet that, like, have you ever met the kind of people that nothing bad has ever happened to them? I think I have, and they're pretty annoying most of the time. Yeah. You meet a lot of trust fundy people that are like, my daddy gave me a trust fund, and I'm just going on the yacht today. Tra -la -la. And they live on a cloud, and they eat unicorn giggles, and they piss rainbows. And they're like the worst, most bad naive people that you've ever met because they never they never had a push before they never pushed past the deadwood and when any kind of like actual danger comes or something that requires a lot of push they just curl up in a ball and they're useless and 
I don't think any of us want to be useless in life, right? So maybe there's a little bit of thankfulness for some trauma, and maybe you can do some good with it until trauma comes on you like like building muscle. You will just say more weight. Bring this is nothing to me. And um, yeah, so there's three tools to handle it. Again, if you want to handle it, and personally, a fourth tool as a Christian is like like why do why do I care when bad things happen to me? Honestly, I'm a friggin' I'm a card carrying member of the Knights of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. I've <laughs> my last breath here is my first breath there as far as I'm concerned. And you asked uh, when we got to the depressive state, when I described like the awfulness of the, of the system of the military industrial complex of the, uh, the corporate crony capitalism is, is there anything that we can do as a society or if there's anything we can do as an individual to stop this? I would say, no, I would say it's kind of outside the control and we've created a beast that we may not be able to slay, but I do know someone from outside the system that actually could. And when you get to know him and when you get to love him and you find out what he built you for and you comply with that, then you really find a meaning that that system can't take away from you, no matter the circumstances. I, uh, I still remember frickin' being in a mudslit trench in Syria. Uh, it's dark. I don't know exactly where we've even been placed and I'm freaking wet. It's raining. The rain's getting into my AK 47 barrel. I've had to shove a cigarette into it. So the rain doesn't rust off the whole part of it. And I'm under a smelly blanket with a, with a curd that's never bathed his whole life. He smells like Harvey Weinstein's sleeping bag and <laughs> friggin And I'm fine because I guess it's at, at that moment that you understand that, that Jesus is all you need. You only understand that Jesus is all you need when Jesus is all you have. And mm. that's a, that's a tool by which you can derive. You can pretty much take anything on. Eh. Yeah. And you don't even, Any I, I mean, my input to that would be, it doesn't even need to just be Jesus. It has to be a higher power established mm -hmm. above all else. It has to be something that you can say, this is my meaning. Perhaps I uh, I would be I would be very careful with that because you can you can go from something that is based in reason and based in some of the things that you've observed into self delusion and, and if you smell a dirty sock long enough and you think good thoughts eventually it's going to bring you a sense of meaning and hope and security but it's not actually going to do anything when I say I believe that Jesus can solve our problems I'm believing that there's an actual literal god man which has promised to return to us and i have i have reason logical based reasons for that man's return that he existed that things are the way they are so i would be very careful not to move into the into the realm of self-delusion but yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> i guess as long as the higher power that you have discovered and come to terms with has an effect on your life which makes your life better and your motives to do the same to others. I suppose, but no, I know I'd get very careful about um, putting life into mere morality. There's a lot of belief systems that will make you a more moral person. It'll make you a better person will have more integrity and all this other things, but that's not the meaning and the purpose of life. Like, I, like I could show you the meaning and purpose of life and it's not an abstract philosophical concept that like only the, the rich can spend a lot of time scratching their beard under a freaking tree, meditating about the nature of the universe get to get. And it's not about something that's about mere morality or how well you can follow a moral system and be a good boy. Uh, how well you obey the 10 commandments and how obey, well you obey the three 637 Levitical laws and the five pillars of Islam and the four noble truths and the 10 rules for life, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I like my purpose and meaning of life is an actual person that came onto this earth and knows how hard it is to be a human then knows you're not a robot and will work with you. Mm. So uh, I would be careful to say that the meaning of life is like to be a better person. Cause there's a lot of philosophies out there that can make you a better person other than Christianity. I totally agree. I just think that the, the meaning of life goes beyond morality. Yeah. yeah. What would you say drives you most to be moral? Oh, I, uh, Hmm. 
No, I uh, I guess I don't agree with the question in a weird way. Nothing drives me to be moral. I I love this person that hmm, how do I describe this? There's a part in the Bible where Jesus heals a blind man, and there's actually a couple of these, but this one's pretty unique in that he pulls the man away from the crowd first, and he he doesn't heal him in front of the crowd, he doesn't heal him in front of the hundreds of people. He heals them way off to the side on a personal level. And you have to ask what's going on here in the Bible. And you had a time period in which if something bad happened to you, it was because in Jew, old Jewish Judeo culture, it was because you were a bad, immoral person. And this blind guy, his whole life had been a spectacle to be pitied on the side of the road. And it was a circus and everybody looked down on him because he's a bad person. His parents did something bad. That's why he's blind. But Jesus pulled him to the side because not only did he want to heal his eyesight, but what you see is a person of such kindness that he cared enough about this, this individual man's ego to protect it, to not make him a spectacle because he, he cared enough to do that, which is insane when you're thinking that this is the actual God, like the same being that formed the earth. The same being that formed the stars, the same being that carved the fjords of Netherlands is the same person that knew this man well enough and cared enough to demonstrate a level of kindness to him. And to me, that is such utter beauty. There's a lot of people that can't stand Christianity. And they're always like, I had a bad time at the Mormon church. I had a bad time at the Catholic church. I got exploited by this awful organization for money and so that they can exploit me for purpose and power and prestige for themselves. I've never heard anybody hate on Christianity because they didn't like Jesus. Yeah. And I, you fall in love with this guy and you're like, how do I please him? What can I do with my life that would make Christ happy? Because I love him. And morality tends to emanate from that. I guess the best description I ever kind of heard is like mere Christianity, pure Christianity, without all the religiosity, without the stupid stained glass windows and the pipe organs and the transubstantiation and, and, and feuding and the lights off voodoo nonsense that is the Catholic Church and all these other stupid churches. Mere Christianity is like simply this, that you're, there's something fundamentally wrong with you and all of humanity and all of us that creates the awful kind of military industrial complex, crony capitalistic beast of revelation. There's something wrong with us, but your engineer loved you so much anyway, that he valued you so much anyway, that he made a way to fix you. And the only thing you have to do is just have the humility to acknowledge that. And you can never pay him back, so you pay it in a million years. You can never pay it back, so you pay it forward. You want to be kind to people. You want to help people because you love him. That, that's where morality emanates from as a, as a secondary characteristic. It's kind of a side effect of just loving Jesus. I don't know. Is that, does that explain it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think uh, the, the form of this, what you called mere Christianity, I believe is a... I believe there's a name for that sect, that belief system. I think it's called Christian Universalism. Tell me if I'm wrong. Oh, there's a million sects. Uh, yeah, let's see. And they get into quabbles and they get into fights. I don't know universal Christianism. I know that there's non-denomination and they kind of tend to get that. Yeah, but, I think uh, Christian of... Universalism is like non-denominational, the idea that we are, mm -hmm. f yes, flawed, but not evil, kind of, and that no one deserves hell is another kind of primarily primary belief of theirs well as a knight of the lutheran church missouri synod our uh, our understanding and doctrine is that people are evil but he can fix it and it's exclusively through faith and grace it's just the loving grace the gift from him and that's it. It's not about you committing works. And it's like, oh, now, now you like Jesus. Okay, you better tithe. You better do this, and you better do that, and you better be a good boy, and you better obey these. And that that just becomes burdensome. You're never going to be able to lift all that yourself. And now you're just going to run around life with a bunch of useless guilt. Yeah. There's, 
I, I think one of the most anti-religious people on the planet that hated that stuff was Jesus himself. He spent his like, only you read the New Testament, he spent a lot of his time going, you Pharisees, you put big burdens on other people that you yourself will not lift a finger uh, to help. And it's like, yeah, that, that's, I guess, our stance and my stance accordingly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm curious. I have a Dog. statement for you and I want your assessment of it. This mm. is not something I'm saying is true or false, but I need to know what you think about it. Okay. Jesus was a socialist. Hmm. Yeah. Let's see. The early church were a bunch of commies. It's true. The early church <laughs> was a bunch of dirty commies because they got together and they sold an enormous amount of their, they sold all of their goods and all of their wealth. Uh, and they cobbled it together and they had that wealth and they used it to help the poor. So from that system, I suppose you could say socialism, communism, collectivism, but there's no, uh, there's no command from God about the particulars. Jesus didn't come back and go, okay, this is, these are the exact things that you're going to have to put into law and codify. That's going to create an usher in the utopia. Cause these people knew that the problem isn't like, the problem isn't with the individual coding of how we we manipulate laws, and we're never going to create some sort of perfect economic system that's going to bring about a great equality. The problem is with you and with me, and no amount of like rejiggering an economic system is going to fix the head. Mm. And is it more moral to go? socialist capitalist this is that is i don't know you know me man i'm like the most apolitical guy i really don't yeah. care if if tomorrow communist china invaded america at first i'd be like hey you can't do that this is our country but if they took washington dc tomorrow and they were not corrupt and they were not printing money nonstop, and all of a sudden like the bridges are all fixed and they're rubbing fiber optic <laughs> cable on the ground and they're like oh Wait, well, this isn't so bad. What, what are we complaining about? Like, everybody has a good standard of living, and there's health care, and there's, like, the, I'm not, like, I'm not married to democracy or republic or communism or fascism or socialism or thisism or thatism. I, I don't see the individual uh, gears of how we, we reconfigure things to be that important. Yeah, I, I'm very, I just don't care. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, was Jesus a socialist? Jesus was Jesus, and maybe we uh, we should be careful in attributing to thing, him things that we we like or hate accordingly. Uh, I, I would say, if anything, and if there are further questions like this, the most important thing to remember is you aim for him first, and if other things fall in, then you then you don't worry about it. But don't put those things first, and then use him to get those things. Don't prop socialism above Jesus. Don't prop capitalism above Jesus, and then use Jesus as a stepping stone. To get to that other thing he's a person and i i highly doubt he hates he enjoys being used mm. yeah i think if he came back he'd probably be like dude you're selling merch of me can you fucking not <laughs> oh the buddy jesus where he's like hey even the <laughs> from, like, uh, from the movie dogma i what, love that what thing. would you think what do you think jesus would say without telling you that you have to know like what would mm? what do you think jesus's opinion would be on everybody using the thing that killed him as the, well, like, as, as the cross is yeah. the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Which didn't come across until much later. Like originally we kind of used the little fish symbol and things like that. And he's, yeah, I've seen comics like that. Like you're using the electric chair that killed me as the symbol of love and hope. <laughs> and especially when you get to not just, not just the crosses of the little T, but the whole crucifix where he's like nailed to that thing. Um, it's honestly just a totem, a reminder of the important things. And I hope, that the particular symbol isn't considered some magical talisman. It's just meant to remind you of like, uh, as a symbol that reminds you of how much he values you mm -hmm. and how much he's willing to go through for you. That, that's my hope. But yeah, what he would say exactly about the cross, I don't know. But yeah. I, I look forward to hearing all about it from him. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so there are a couple Dog. of different things I also want to cover while you're here and if we're gonna do a, a video uh of each one then this would be probably be the cut point because you did a really good job with that segment i'm like super happy with it uh that was incredible um so you. your praise means everything to me and my day is now spectacular <laughs> <laughs> so the next thing that i have in my mind that i want to hear about is 
the difference between uh, state employee or what would it be? Difference between private and public military work. Oh, private contract versus public contracting? You mean like being in the military versus being a private contractor? Yes. Oh, uh, well, obviously the pay is very nice. Let's see. If you are in the military in of itself, in the public sector, it's like being a slave. You're literally under a new set of laws. It's horrifying. You are under the uniform code of military justice, and your life is almost entirely in the hands of the whims of your command. It's built in such a way that if they want to start doing the paperwork and they want to start doing the punishment, if they do not like you, then they can make your life a living hell. Uh, and yeah, there are there are bars here and there. They're not going to like beat you with sticks or anything like that, but they can they can assign you job duties you don't want to be at. They can make you kind of hurt yourself physically. In a lot of ways, they can make sure you don't get promotions or you don't go uh, get the jobs you want. And they can whole they can wholeheartedly take that part of your life it's miserable yeah you are under the whims of other people you have no freedom and as a private contractor like if i don't like something i'm like i'm out of here screw you guys I, I i get paid per month maybe your contract stipulates that if you can fulfill the whole thing you get a little bit of a bonus at the end but now you're your own person like a normal american uh a businessman basically and it's like yeah if 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 you don't like something, you're out. You have way more control over your negotiations. The other nice thing, too, is as a contractor, you tend to be an uh, individual augmentee to other people. And uh, this was actually one of my favorite things. I, um, uh, when I was in the Army, I was at the division level, and I spent a whole lot of time. I, oh, God, I hated it. Uh, I spent a whole lot of the time with the top brass and telling them, like, uh, General, I believe by consolidating our forces, we are removing ourselves from the battle space at night and allowing the Taliban to, we are conceding and ceding territory to the Taliban and further legitimizing them while we run away and hide in our base for the purposes of careerism. I recommend that we go back out at these places at night, and I know it's dangerous, but that's part of the war, and I think it'll help us accomplish our mission. They would say, Shut the F up. Who the hell are you? Who let this guy in here? <laughs> you're just a junior enlisted, and then you're just an E5. You're nothing. You're nobody. Uh, go away. Punish this man. Go give him, like, garbage detail for a while. Go let it, give him uh, freaking poop-burning detail. But when I became a private contractor, I grew my beard out a little bit. And I didn't have to wear a stupid rank on my chest that told the people who looked at me how much respect I was supposed to be given or how little respect I was supposed to be given accordingly. And I would go to these exact same brass and I'd be like, General, I believe by consolidating our forces, I'd give them the exact same speech and recommendation. And they'd be like, huh, that's a good idea. What an intelligent thing to say. Yes, we are certainly paying this private contractor a lot of money for a good reason. Like the, the money like <laughs> gave me more respect than when I was a private, even when I was saying the exact same thing. So uh, you're valued infinitely more as a private contractor. It's like, otherwise, why would we be paying you so much as it, to give us this kind of consultant work? So there's a, there's two differences right there. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. It, any other questions or I don't know. I guess I can mumble about being a contractor. Go mm. for it. No. Oh. Yeah, being a contractor was cool. Not having a lot of responsibilities was cool. I guess uh, my time as a private contractor was infinitely better because I wasn't part of the division headquarters anymore. If you know anything about the military, division is the place where hope really goes to die. It's where all the top brass and all the top people come. And the it's the weirdest freaking ranking system because when every what's the old uh, thing from the incredibles when everybody's special nobody's special and because there were so many high ranking people and there were still duties that had to be done you had like sergeant first classes that would be normally in charge of whole platoons instead they were mopping floors <laughs> and you would have like colonels that like if they were out on a outpost themselves there they would be like i demand that this rail cart be draped in silk and everybody be like yes colonel we worship thee thank you but here at division level it's like well there's a colonel there's a colonel there's a big whoopty crap what does a colonel want this time get out of here colonel crunch if you're no you're nobody here so that was a bit of an irony about it um 
yeah, division sucked. But when I was contracting, I was at the ground level. I was in a far flung outpost and I'm hanging around with just a bunch of cool dudes, the Navy SEALs, who don't get into drama. They don't get into drama because they don't have anything to prove. They're they're at the top of the pile. They they don't have to get in your face. They don't have to worry about like, oh, is this person shaving today or stupid uniform error things. Uh, you got treated with respect and you just did your job. And the job I did was super duper cool. I was, uh, you ever see Archer, the cartoon Archer? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was like Krieger from Archer. It was great. Like, uh, I, I've got degrees in uh, communications, electronic engineering, automation, robotics, digital forensics, and tool and die. And they would ask these like questions like, today we need to sneak. Uh, we want a GPS device snuck into a shoe that we're going to put on one of our, in, uh, our agents that we're running. And he's going to go visit uh the frickin the taliban commander's place and he's gonna leave his shoes there and then we're gonna drop a bomb on that gps locator <laughs> can you make that for us like yes i can <laughs> but uh, that was private contracting on public contracting you're just a stupid enlisted soldier put your eye sockets and do this po- tap this button push just this button just do boring pedantic paperwork spreadsheet nonsense and you're like man i'm really frickin I'm not being used to my full potential here. Yeah, it sounds like they're missing out on so much work that could be done by somebody with the skills to do it without even like, yeah. they wouldn't even have to pay you more. They, You would just, I mean, preferably. I do it for free for fun. Yeah, you want to do it for the experience. But uh, in the army, you're a body first. The Air Force is a little bit different. The Air Force is, uh, I love the old saying, the there's only two military forces. There's the army and the navy. The Air Force is a corporation, and the Marines are a cult dedicated to giving people with personality disorders guns. <laughs> and in the Jesus. Air Force, you, you just do your the job that you've been assigned, and you do it well. But in the Army, you're just a body. They're like, I need a private here. I need a specialist here. I need a, I, I need a sergeant over here. Guard these guys. Uh, drive this bus. And you're like, but I'm a helicopter repairman. And like, yeah, I don't care. Shut up, body. Do what I tell you, tell you to do. That was the army for me. It that was, sounds uh, like being a chess it's, piece. Yeah, it's like Mondo is pawn in Game of Life. <laughs> mm-hmm. I wonder which one uh, you enjoyed more. Yeah, right? Do I enjoy getting paid a lot to do a good job for of which I have some sort of agency? I uh, I think it's it's online. It's called The Four Things That Make a job good and that's agency you have some say in what you're doing that day it's a link between effort and reward as in if you're going to put in the effort you're going to get more out of it uh complexity in that friggin what you're doing isn't just screw part a into part b but it's actually engaging you in a way that's helping you grow and uh finally the the fourth part is that there is meaning to the work you do you're not just in old ireland making a famine road for the sake of making a road to give the government poor people uh, money you're doing something that's actually going to impact the world those are the four things how many of us in the states get to say that we get any of those one things let alone all four of them and you can imagine being the army you're getting none of them and people are yelling at you and you're not getting paid anything and you're and your friends dead that again ptsd uh yeah, it, it's a breeding ground for trauma mm-hmm. and poverty and misery. Yeah. What do you think is like the bare minimum that could be done to make the mm-hmm. life of veterans fair compared to the rest oh. of us? Well, I guess the first thing you could do is you could goddamn pay them when they're in the army. Like there's a lot of people that when they're in the army, they're on food stamps. That's that's an embarrassment wow can you imagine like going on a deployment and freaking working these 16 hours a day doing this dangerous complicated work that nobody else wants to do and you're on food stamps and freaking the contractor that you had to train the other day which is sitting in the seat next to you is the one making two hundred thousand dollars three hundred thousand dollars that year to do less work than you cool so you could pay them i know that sounds crazy right uh that way that when they get out they actually have some cash to buy a house, not live in their car, not be on food stamps, not be dependent on government handouts, uh, but to live their own individual life. Um, Other things that could be done for veterans specifically. Hmm. 
Um, mostly in the job hunt, I think. Uh, it used to be back in the day that being a veteran was a great thing because of all the educational benefits that you're going to get. You're going to get your educational bennies. And sure, like in the 60s or 70s, you could walk into a bank and be like, I've got a four-year degree. I'll take that high-paid position right over there. You've got like your eighth grade reading level that they're all super duper impressed by and you get the job because back in the day a four-year degree was just like a free a free life get out of jail free card that made sure that you had your own yes men and everybody like clapped for you nowadays degrees are nothing degrees are a joke every single job i go to how can i plug you into the system right now to make me money how how uh, what can you do for me right now they don't, and that is almost always work experience or for government job. If you're trying to get government jobs, that's usually who, you know, mm -hmm. so you have, if we're doing a huge disservice to veterans, one of them is our inability to get them a damn job so they could be a human being again. And I guess our number two thing is, I don't know. It, it would also probably help them to get a job if you stop giving this Hollywood hyper reality of the Rambo PTSD veteran. It's kind of hard to give a job, but even you're like, you're going for a job. And sometimes you don't even want to mention that you were in the military because it brings with it negative connotations. Like, Oh God, this guy's from the army. If we hire him from the job, he's just going to do push ups and yell at people. <laughs> yeah. He's going to be one of those obnoxious type a personality Rambo. Thank me for my service kind of people. And it's like, no, man, I just want a job. <laughs> I swear. Uh, so there's that negative connotation. It tends to come a lot from kind of the Hollywood system that creates movies of unstable uh, veterans. Yeah. So there's two things. There you go. Uh, oh, I got a good question. Firstly, let me read off donations. Uh, I missed one earlier, but it, that was like an hour ago. So I don't think I'm going to be able to find it. Wait, can I? Mm -hmm. Can I find it? No, I can't. Okay. Uh, well, anyways. Uh, Thank you, Crimson, Chrissy, Chrissick, and Sujwin for the donations. Uh, Sujwin had a question. What do you think is, what would you say is a good charity to help veterans, like actually help them, not some kind of racket disguised as a charity? Oh, um, the Wounded Warrior Project's a pretty good one. The Wounded Warrior Project will actually use that money to take a veteran to a ball game take a veteran fishing like you have actual individuals that aren't just shoveling money at them because that's one of the things like you you go to the va and they're like cool here's your bennies here's we're gonna cut you your check take these opioids uh lie down and rot chill out and don't be an issue because they don't want to give the individual or they can't give the individual personal touch to so many veterans but things like the wounded warrior project these guys will actually like these are usually other veterans or family members of veterans that know how hard it is. And if you give them money, they're going to use that. They're pretty honorable people. They're going to use that money to understand the individual issues of the veteran and try to actually help them out. And that's a, I think that's what we need a lot when it comes to charities is you need the personal touch, not just a wad of money. So, yeah, Wounded Warrior Project's a pretty good one. Or uh, better yet, donate directly to me, direct right here. Just, just give, me, give me money. Give me money. <laughs> I mean, I'm technically, so you're poor. helping a veteran. There's uh, no S there, but. Meh. Yeah. Uh, Ye. Oh, thank you, Poverty Midas, for the $10. This was a fascinating discussion. I agree. Uh, let's see. What do we. Do you have anything to say about your time? doing like cyber mm -hmm. you said cyber forensics digital forensics. uh that is that is digital forensics digital you want forensics. me to talk about some of the digital forensics that i did for the uh special projects group the seals yes as much as you can tell me of course oh yeah that's no problem that's a uh, the kind of things that are classified uh that i would get in trouble and i would like be pulled by the cia into some black site and like be in fort leavenworth my boxers on backwards that is uh those are Things that we did where we weren't really pulling punches with the kind of sneaky beaky stuff that hurt the Taliban, that which are strategies we may want to use in the future. Uh, mm. Those are the things I will not touch on. Digital forensics for the special projects group was uh, was actually super fun. Uh, what we had with uh, during the war on terror is we had what was called insider threat attacks. 
And that's the local nationals that we would hire to help build up the base, help maintain and keep the base, whether it's sweeping the streets or whether that's cleaning the bathrooms or they're helping construct a new building or welding or whatever. But some of these guys were bad guys and they were specifically hired out by the Taliban. Hey, go in there, get a job at that base and sneak in stuff. Or I'm going to sneak you a gun and you're going to shoot the commander with this gun. Or you're going to do as much damage as you can. I, uh, I remember in Bagram Airfield, there was one Thanksgiving where the insider had managed to smuggle in large quantities of pesticide that they were going to throw into Thanksgiving food. And they were going to poison an entire, the biggest base in Afghanistan. Insider threats were, for, like, for a large quantity of time, huge, probably some of the biggest threats we faced there. So what I would do is if there was anybody who was suspicious, uh, the SEALs would snatch up their computer uh, with their laptop or what have you, and they would bring it to me and I would make a forensic copy of the hard drive. And then like he can, boop, 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 we return the laptop as if it's untouched. And I would go and comb through the hard drive for encrypted files, hidden files, deleted files. Because uh, a lot of people don't understand that when you delete a file on a computer, the, the file is not gone. The file has been designated an overwrite code that if anything needs to take up that space, it'll be overridden. But if that code doesn't get there in time, the file's still perfectly there. It's just been it's been exited out of the file allocation table. For like a perfectly so preserved it, corpse of a file. <laughs> pretty much. Pretty, pretty much ready to go. I, I guess one of the best descriptions is uh, like your VHS tapes. You can overwrite a VHS tape, but you can't delete a VHS tape. Uh, and so it's almost like this fun little game or puzzle where you're, you're piecing together the file allocation table. What, what, what happens when you delete something is you have a library of files and the computer just goes and goes, huh, okay. And they take the index card from the library and they toss it in the trash, but the file, the book is still on the shelf. So you have to find the book. You have to find like the, uh, yeah, you have to find the book and you have to reconstruct the index card in order to get there. And uh, a lot of it has been incredibly simplified these days. There's a lot of programs, uh, Axiom software, forensics toolkit, thing of that nature that pretty much dumb it down and make it some button monkey stuff. But uh, there's still a call for some people to understand the very specifics of machine code, binary, uh, your ability to read hex code, and your ability to reconstruct uh, it in accordance with the file system, whether that's fat 32 x fat in tfs or whatever and uh, i would use that to crack open the i'm oh sorry i'm going i'm geeking out about digital forensics because i enjoy it so Go much for it. it's fascinating uh, and okay so this is what i would actually find on the thing uh i would break open the guy's friggin laptop and i would get it crack the password and whatever and my favorite thing is they all had porn they all had the weirdest porn like they had, it's always like this Middle Eastern porn is always like covered with flowers. Like imagine the kind of porn you see, but someone's put a portrait of like little heart shapes all around it. And they put a weird blare on it. <laughs> and uh, I guess the other issue I, I was always had was I would get to these files and I'm like, hmm, minor problem. I don't speak Arabic. I don't speak Dari. I don't speak Farsi. I don't speak Pashtun. So me and my translator would be thumbing through massive quantities of pornography from these possible insider threats, looking for emails and communications uh, with the Taliban, with the Haqqani network, with Hezbollah, and all the bad guys that were in Afghanistan. Huh. <laughs> Digital forensics, ladies and gentlemen. Wow. Oh, tell me about, I'm guessing you know something about this. What was on bin Laden's computer when he got its? <laughs> Tell me about that. Yeah. Uh, well, some of the funnier things that really make Osama bin Laden more of a human character is the fact that he played Animal Crossing. He, <laughs> uh, he had Nintendo files. He had anime on his computer. I, uh, I forget if it was One Piece. I remember it was, uh, it was one of those Shonen kind of jump series things like One Piece, Naruto, uh, whatever. Uh, he had, he had a lot of what was really interesting in his last days on his computer. And that was the fact that the Al Qaeda was running out of money. He was just really worried. Like, how is he going to keep Al Qaeda going when the money's running out and the recruitment drives are getting harder and harder because everybody like didn't care about nine 11 anymore. And they wanted to go join ISIS who were the cooler people out there. <laughs> like ISIS was the new hotness. 
uh, about the time that Osama bin Laden was taken out, if I remember correctly, because they were beginning to take territory. And when you take territory, you claim that you are the Islamic caliphate. And that adds legitimacy and that adds more foreign fighters, which allows you to take more territory and it becomes this exponential uh, thing. So Osama bin Laden's last days is him in his bunker watching shonen anime jump stuff, playing Animal Crossing and like fretting over these spreadsheets about how he's going to keep Al Qaeda running. Huh. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I know you like to dehumanize some of the people that, that we, we hate and we like to demonize Osama bin Laden. But I think what a lot of people didn't do for the guy was listen to what he had to say. Like when nine 11 happened, everybody's like, what, why did they do this to us? Why would they, why would they kill 2000 innocent people? And our immediate response from the government was, well, they just hate our freedom. And it was so naive. It seemed like almost propaganda. They hate our freedom. And it's like, Osama bin Laden's got all the freedom that he wants to have. He's a, he's a Saudi prince. He has the money. But it's, um, it's that he, what he was saying was, hey, you guys, even before the war on terror, you spend millions of dollars per second sticking your nose in every other country. You're killing people in Yemen. We're killing people in Yemen right now, to my understanding. I don't even know why we're there. We're to please the Saudi princes, to prop up the value of the petrodollar, to please international banking cartels. Uh, again, it's that it's that headless system, uh, and it's urban sprawled all around the world. And there's people that this isn't the way I want to live. This threatens me and my lifestyle. I don't like this. I don't want this. And you put your military bases in the Holy Lands and you hurt people. And that's what he was saying. And you had a lot of that kind of stuff on his computer too, I guess. Huh. Yeah. Back to the, back to the, the, the urban sprawl military industrial complex, evil machine thing. Uh, quick aside. I don't know why it came to mind, but I, I have to mention it real quick in the, in the game shadow run returns by Hairbrain Studios. It's a fairly basic cyberpunk adventure and all it's like a lot of cyberpunk RPGs where, you know, corporations run the world and corporations run the governments and it's all about conspiracy theories and you're uh, you're a detective or you're a hacker or whatever trying to make your way in the world. And uh the whole game ends up with you preventing this apocalyptic black swan event that would have destroyed the whole world due to a corporation's oversight and greed and things like that and as the camera is panning out and the game is ending and freaking the all of a sudden the, it's panning out and what you've done is covered by the corporate owned media as just a little bit of a gaffe that happened in a lab and the corporate sponsored police are now like cleaning and scrubbing the crime scene and you're as the hero all of a sudden you're not getting the parade for freaking like what you've done that a normal RPG would give you. And instead your comrade claps you on the back and says, good job. And you turn around him and you're saying like, so it's just a big conspiracy theory then. And I'll always remember this. He responds to you in that game. No, God, I wish it's so much worse than that. It is a series of conspiracy theories and conflicting agendas and petty jealousies and seething ambitions all building upon, feeding upon, and excreting into a giant web of dreck that we all have to wade through and call life. I wish it was just one evil wizard that we can run a sword through and call it a day. But alas, life is no simple fairy tale. And I think that's the, the headlessness that we all experience in life from the, the machine that's kind of, that's, that has us that we've been born into the throneness of life. Yeah. Mm. I, I just, I don't know why that came to mind. I guess I'm trying to describe the, the larger things that are there. They're kind of beyond comprehension that again, maybe I should be fucking taking this PTSD medication for it. Dude. I think, I think what you have been saying this entire time, like the only person who wouldn't take you seriously during this is someone who wasn't willing to actually think about what you're saying. There's a lot of important things that you've said so far today. And I'm not only have I gotten to hear them, but you know, this is going to get broadcast to the world and it is right now. And that's amazing. All right. I can't wait to wind up dead tomorrow. It was a conspiracy all along. <laughs>
That's amazing. I have had the FBI knock on my door. It is frustrating. Really? Yeah, I, uh, I went to Syria, remember? And yeah, I mean, we never did a part two with the Syria thing. We uh, we, we kind of got drunk and we kind of got tired and we kind of left it off it there. But uh, remember, there's a whole how the hell do I get back across the Tigris River and back to Iraq and then back home? And that involved a lot of things. It involved bribery. It involved uh, because I, I had this passport that said, Originally, I'm just going into Iraq for a week on a work visa, and then I cross over and I don't pay attention to this passport's work visa, and it becomes null and void, and then I bribe a guy to give me a stamp, and now I have a passport that says, I've been in Iraq unaccounted for 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 frickin' half a year to a year, and the FBI is like, what? Who is this guy? What's going on here? <laughs> What's the YPG? A terrorist group, according to the t- uh, Turkish government. Uh oh, what rut roll, Raggy? <laughs> so uh, <laughs> every time I try to fly, I get like the super scrutinized look. Like I, I, I'm not on the no fly list, but I'm on what's called the four S's, which is the super screen. Every time I want to get on the plane, shove the dog right up this guy's butt. Uh, oh. Security stringent stuff. And it's funny when you check in, too, because every single time a nonchalant, nice lady at the ticket counter is going to like her eyes are going to widen open like burr, burr, burr. you see it on her screen. It's this red flashing thing. <laughs> oh, I'll be right back. And like the, she goes around the corner and brings like four or five burly guys like uh, uh, and she'll point at the screen. I'm like, <laughs> can I see what's on there? <laughs> what, what the hell is this? And uh, I w- it, it's also kind of funny, and it shows you how porous our borders are. Uh, I was in the States for at least two years before the FBI came to knock on my door. Uh, I finally flagged in their system because I had wanted to buy a, a specific shotgun at a shotgun show. And that flagged me in their system. And they're like, mar, 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 we got them. Go, go get them. And it wasn't that bad. It was just a nice conversation with some, some dudes. Mm-hmm. And they they, uh, they pegged me with a bunch of annoying signals based intelligence questions concerning the YPG. Like they really thought like, what's the password to their super secret encrypted satellite system? And it's like the YPG, like a tin can and some wire. <laughs> Why do you keep asking me these intent? Oh yeah, they've they've really got some stuff. No, they're not high tech people. Not being high tech is actually one of the the. It has saved so many terrorists. And that we have very good interception abilities, but they're so low tech. It you can't you can't intercept with a satellite carrier pigeon like technology. <laughs> as a whole thing, whatever. Continue with with whatever anybody wants to ask. Uh, let's see. So you said that <clears throat> it was a whole process to get out of there. Like, mm-hmm. give me the rundown of that. Oh, whole process to get out of there. Okay, so. Uh, I always wanted to stay in Syria to fight at Raqqa because Raqqa was where the real battle was at, where the real action was going to happen. And I promised myself, like, I'm going to stay till Raqqa. And after there, after we kick ISIS out of Raqqa, all of northern Syria and uh, the Rojava area is going to be secure for the Kurds. That seems like a legitimate thing. But we stalled. We just stalled for months at a time and didn't take any territory. And it was really weird, too, because we had villages we had to have 300 people on our side and on their side they must have had like two isis members and we're like and i'm like why why are we just stalling here we could take this we can move on we could push forward uh and i think it's because of the political situation in the area the best way i could describe the situation is here you have you have all sorts of parties during the power vacuum that was the syrian uh isis conflict you had Oh, God, you had ISIS, you had the YPG, you had Assad's forces, you had Russians backing Assad's forces, you had Americans backing the YPG, you had Russian mercenary Wagner groups also backing Assad's forces, and you had Christian militias forming that just wanted to protect their own little areas from all the craziness, because Christians were getting crucified at the time in makeshift ramshackle crucifixions. Uh, You had veterans like me, which were just a bunch of randos, not paid by anyone to just walk into the area and help the YPG out. You, uh, You had a lot of people. And I like to think of the scenario politically as as a Pokemon thing, like fire type beats grass type, grass type beats water type. Like ISIS 
could take on Turkey and Assad's forces, because what ISIS does is it subverts, it knows how to handle government organizations, but it can't take on the YPG, because the YPG are fanatically, uh, they are fanatics about their, their, their belief system. And uh, there were situations where when frickin' Turkey came down to take the territory from the YPG, there were YPJ ladies that jumped onto those tanks with dynamite or, or with C4, and they blew up those tanks in suicide bombings <laughs> because they loved socialist democracy enough to die for it. ISIS couldn't take on the YPG, but it could take on Turkey and Assad. Turkey and Assad could take on the YPG because the the they had air forces and there's nothing the ypg ypg could do about air power the only thing stopping the ypg was american coalition forces because we wanted to use the ypg to defeat isis (laughs) at the time and had the ypg defeated successfully and pushed out their territory all of isis then coalition forces would just go home. And what would happen? Turkey would run uh, down with their tanks and they would crush all the YPG in the area because they're like, to them, the YPG is a terrorist group. They're not going to be bordered with the terrorist group, Uh, which is exactly what happened. Once ISIS was no longer a threat in the area, we left. Donald Trump uh, said, F these guys. We're out. We outie. And then Turkey ran them down. Uh, I don't, I, I haven't kept track of the situation. I think there's still pockets of, of the YPG or which became the SDF, the security defense forces there. <clears throat> but yeah, you had a weird Pokemon scenario and you had a disincentivization by the YPG command to finish the job. Cause they knew when they finished the job, they would have to turn and fight for their lives against these other forces. And also they wouldn't get the, uh, they would no longer get the supplies and money and backing from the United States government military industrial complex because <laughs> as much as they hated Amer- uh, america as great satan uh capitalist monster that's consuming the world they want night vision and they want bullets and they want bombs and they want anti-air so like they want our stuff they america is still santa claus of weapons he's the rich so, enemy it, of their enemy exactly yeah yeah so uh that's so that's why i left because we weren't doing anything and it's like dude if i wanted to do nothing with like do absolutely nothing and not get paid for it i would have stayed in the army so (laughs) i uh i got in one of the trucks that was just heading east like i just kind of jumped in the back with some of the other westerners and we uh we debriefed we got all of our stuff back it's really funny because they didn't want to at academia we had new uh, western volunteers coming in they did not want for the life of them uh, the us to talk to those Western volunteers to tell them the truth about a lot of the situation. So they tried to keep us apart. Like, no, they're going to taint the fresh, the fresh guys, <laughs> the, the high spirited people. Uh, we, we crossed the river again and it was infinitely easier this time uh, because we kind of just did it in broad daylight. Like at that point, I guess we just didn't, they really care about getting YP, uh, YPG Western volunteers in, in secret. But they don't seem to care about their outgoing. Like, pff, it's all on you now. We don't give a crap. Yeah. And uh, we, crossed, uh, we crossed the river. Uh, we get picked up by Border Patrol. It just gives us a basic interrogation. What you doing there? And like, just tell them the truth. Fighting against ISIS. F those guys. And like, yeah, rock on. Because the, uh, the, the, the northern Iraqis are Kurdish Peshmerga, too. They have no love of ISIS. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and uh, you go back into the mountain camp for a while. You get handed enough money to buy a plane ticket. Funny enough, they didn't pay us enough for, for a Goran plane ticket. Second, funny enough, it was all counterfeit money in the first place. <laughs> like, you're not going to, you're paying me in counterfeit money and you're cheaping out? Really? You're printing the stuff and I'm not worth more of it. So I had to pay for most of the plane ticket myself. Uh, they, they sent us to Erbil, Iraq? Yeah, we flew into Slovenia, but we full, uh, flew out of Erbil. And this is one of the things that, really sucks about being an american is you always see the hollywood movies where if you just get to the embassy the ambassador will take care of you and the consulate will take care of you it was no such luck the american consulate does not give a rip about you it's just some like one little bureaucrat going who are you what's a ypg 
did you have a baby while you're here? I don't care. <laughs> so you're completely SOL, which is bogus because there's so many European nations where like the, the Brits came back with us and they're like, oh, there, there, Nigel, we've got your back, love. The queen herself will come fly down and pick you up on graceful wings and bring you home when they went to their embassy. And frickin', uh, yeah, I, I think there's like, I don't know if it's Swiss forces or anything like that, but if you call a certain number for one of those really nice Scandinavian countries and you're in danger, Scandinavian special forces will come down and rescue you personally. Whereas when you're an American, you're like, yeah, we're not going to come get you. Do you have a lot of money? No, no, you don't. We're not going to come get you. Figure it out yourself. <laughs> and figuring it out ourselves uh, ended up being bribing a guy $200 to stamp that passport and then using counterfeit money to buy a plane ticket uh through jordan to to get out of there because we weren't going to go obviously through istanbul that place would have put us in the the white torture room no thank you mm -hmm. uh really funny aside when i'm trying to bribe the guy i like i don't know how to bribe haggle right if i need a stamp from you i'm like oh man that's a shame i seem to have dropped this 50 dollar bill it would be a shame if i looked away right now and the guy the the stamp guy is just like yeah, you should pick that up. <laughs> like, oh, it would be a shame if I dropped this hundred dollars bill. Why don't you just tell me how much you want me to bribe you? <laughs> and uh, my roommate was like, dude, and he slips a 200 and, was, and the guy just stamps his paper and like, oh, why don't you just tell me? And I slip him 200 and then he stamps it. And then, it, then I got the, uh, the thing to go home. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. Let me, uh, let me get a drink here. I'm losing my voice. Yeah. I, I uh, usually don't talk this much. Yeah. Oh, yum, I'll, yum, I'll yum. run an ad while I take a drink too. Sweet. Yeah, we're actually sober. How lame is that? I know, right? Uh. Yeah. Wet my whistle, my whistle. Yes. Body <sighs> lubrication. Yeah. Let's see. Patizda. So, your plan to go to Ukraine. What about it? When were you planning on going? And when you uh, were going to go, like, how long were you going to stay? Uh, I was going to stay for at least a six-monther and just kind of play it by ear at the time. Uh, I, I feel like it would have been the same with the YPG. Like, if I'm not going to be used in a useful manner, then I'm just going home. But if you're going to use me, then I'll stay as long as the war needs. Yeah. That, that was the plan stay for it. And but then I got kicked off the plane without all my stuff. And w when it first began, again, anybody was allowed to get in because they needed bodies. But now you can't get in unless you show up with your gear. And then they take my gear at the plane. What, what am I supposed to do? You know? Yeah. Uh, if you have any contacts that would like to contact you to talk to me about, hey, we, and you trust them. Because I don't know if it's some freaking Russian BS that's going to get my head cut off. Like, not this again. <laughs> uh, yeah. I have a guy for uh, you. Please. Sweet. Yeah, get them in contact with me. Oh, God. Did it kick oh. me out? Oh. Player, you're not found. Oh, oh you're just going to have to reset the... The, the boundary box? Boundary oh, but box, I am yeah. still, I'm still in the room with you. Yeah, so I'll explain oh, kind of how he could help you. Oh, there you go. Okay, you're I've lower. Been, where, where uh, click, am I? Oh, click my God. standing, seated slash standing play in quick actions, and it'll fix you. Yeah, you it cool. just... Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, well, you know what you're talking about. You do yeah, this VR stuff more than cool. me. Cool. Uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, so I actually have a guy coming on stream soon <clears throat> who I did like an hour recording with, and then mm -hmm. we were going to do another hour and then it, we never did. So now we're going to do a stream, uh, on oh. Saturday and he nice. went to Ukraine. Uh, he wasn't part of the foreign legion. Uh, okay. I don't think he, he was solo and he ended up finding some, some people to go with and oh, nice. took some bodies while he was there. He meant to just be a medic, but he ended up. They just gave him an AK and we're like, dude, do what you got to do. So if oh, you yeah. need someone to help you get in there, he is absolutely a good reference. He would know. Hey, yeah, put me in contact with him. Then. I, I look forward to it. Yeah, I will. But I'm not doing do anything that. but like spinning my wheels here in the States anyway. So yeah. Uh, question. <sighs> if you're working. God, right do now, I want to be in Ukraine in the winter? Should I wait for spring? It's going to be so cold. <laughs> <laughs> uh Ugh. How's, Go to uh, Russia during the winter. You think I know anything about history, about how bad of an idea that yeah, is? Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> that's we we tried that. 
Yeah. Although, wasn't there that that time that the what was it? The Russians tried to invade the Finns uh, in the winter. Yeah, and it went. Are you even referring worse to that them. guy? Are you referring to that story about the guy that took all the methamphetamine ever? No. <laughs> and oh, well, I don't know if it was Finland or Scandinavia or again one of those one of those northern kind of on the peninsula countries. But I very vaguely recall a story about a man that was fighting against. I think it was the Russians. I don't think it was the Nazis. He was fighting the Russians, and his whole platoon had gotten wiped out, and he was he was defending his country on, like, skis. It was one of those kind of things. And he took all the methamphetamine meant for that company, all the battle drugs, in one go. And he went on, I want to say, like, a week-long killing bender as he would skate through their lines. <laughs> <laughs> and he he doesn't even remember most of what happens. He vaguely remembers eating a pine cone, capturing and like, eating like a blue jay. Oh. <laughs> and when they got to him, he had lost like 70 pounds. His heart was going as fast as a hummingbird's. And his eyeballs looked like he had seen the face of God and spit in it. <laughs> Uh, you'd have to you'd have to Google that one up. That's a hoot. Yeah. Uh, do you know the story of that Finnish sniper? I think he was called the White Death or something. Sounds badass. I don't know. Yeah. He apparently he like his entire time in the army, they gave him they offered him like the highest tech shit, right? Like mm. newest scopes, newest rifles, everything, and he just used the same hunting rifle he'd been using since he was like fifteen. For the entirety, yeah, you and he took like the most bodies the, of any soldier. Yeah, you use the be the best gun is the one you know. Yeah, I mean, that's just a fact. Yep. Yeah, that's just like that's some Chad shit right there. Yeah, <laughs> I, uh, I never got the sniper appeal. Like, there's a I know we have American sniper and we have Chris Kyle and we have things like that, and they have very high body counts and all that. You watch a lot of the Hollywood movies, really building them up, and it's like I never quite understood. Like, I'm not talking they're bad people, and I'm not shitting on me. Like, they do good work. But how come there's an American sniper movie due to his lethality, but there's not an American drone operator movie <laughs> due to their lethality? Because there's a guy, like, sitting in a shipping container in Las Vegas that smells like farts, and he's pushing buttons all day long, and he's getting way higher kill counts than Chris Kyle, even covered in Cheeto dust in his Lazy Boy. I, I want to see that movie. <laughs> like, Bro, imagine I they see start that. having drone pilots work from home. <laughs> the new Zoom call, <laughs> where you just have one button to drop the bomb. They're like, here, we'll give you fiber internet. Here's your control panel. We'll give you a tech support number in case it stops working on your shitty laptop from 2009. <laughs> right? hit him like a sniper kills a person usually with impunity from like half a mile to a mile or more away from a guy that never knew he was there and friggin the drone operator does even more kills from a greater distance it, it's kind of weird that i guess that's one of the weird things about war is a lot of people want to like go to war and be a big hero or something like that and like succeeding in war is actually about being the biggest coward you can be. How can I bring the most death from the furthest away and put myself in the least dangerous spot? Uh, we, we used to, in Afghanistan, like, you, we would call the Taliban cowards because they would emplace explosive devices and IEDs and booby traps and then run away and then set them off. And like, oh, you scared bastards, you come fight us man to man. But it's like, well, wait a minute. It's not really a fair fight then either because we're the ones in the half million dollar armored vehicles with the scopes and the vision systems. And we're bombing them from like two or three miles up in the sky while calling them cowards. And it just like all of war is really just everybody murdering each other in a in the most the most cowardly way is going to be the most effective way. Yeah. So I don't know why heroism would be a part of that, and hence the bizarre American sniper hero worship. I never got. Like, would you rather who, uh, us who do that pistol movie? duels for everything? Oh, I would rather all of us actually go back to swords. Let's just line up. <laughs> let's 
start clubbing each other. Let's have a gentleman's agreement to club <laughs> each other on an even field. Or uh, or better yet, the um what the Old Testament thing of like David versus Goliath. Your best guy versus our best guy. <laughs> and like once a year we just get together to watch two MMA fighters try to kill each other. There was a It book. almost sounds kind of fun then. There was a book I read where I don't I think it was called like in, in, the second one in the series is called Insignia. I don't remember what the first one is called. But basically, all war is fought, like, you know, uh, mutually assured destruction. No one fights wars on Earth anymore. All the wars are fought on, like, the asteroid belt where all of the valuable shit is. And it's not fought by humans. It's fought by drones that are being controlled by humans. Mm. So It's just a big It's just a big video game. Yeah, so basically... Bust what they did the was, Taliban, Fox... Final destination, no item. Box only, no yeah. item. Final destination, man. Yeah, and what they do is they would just have these like prodigy kids that are amazing at piloting these drones. They would just mm-hmm. they made it into a sporting event. It looked like an esports event is how it was described. So they have. I, it like, almost sounds like it almost sounds. Sorry to interrupt you. It almost sounds like Ender's Game, doesn't it? Yeah, it's similar to that. It. I think. Uh, oh, did you know that the guy who wrote Ender's Game was like ultra homophobic? He, like, I did not know that. People. I know that uh, the guy that wrote uh, Love H.P. Lovecraft is super duper racist. I Aww, still love H.P. Lovecraft, on. but sorry to break it to you, Damn buddy. Yeah, eh, whatever. Uh, uh, here's ten bucks because why uh, not? Also, vanilla or chocolate? It could be any form, just vanilla or chocolate. That's your question. Oh, me? Vanilla or chocolate? Yeah. Oh, I uh, chocolate. Chocolate's better. Chocolate goes with more things. Vanilla is good, but in like very ver- chocolate is incredibly versatile. You can cover like any kind of nut in chocolate. Chocolate for life, dog. Yeah, there you go. Chocolate rain. Thank you, Mellow Stinky, for the ten dollars. Uh, yeah. Well, how do you think warfare is going to be fought fifty years from now? Oh, um, well, I think we're all going to get nuked, probably. <laughs> is that so? <laughs> I I, uh, I hate to be yeah, I hate to be freaking Debbie Downer here about it, but it's like. It almost seems inevitable, doesn't it? Do you really think that we're all just going to come to an intelligent understanding and frickin' have the socialist Star Trek utopia that we desire because we we gave in to the angels of our better nature? No, I don't. I don't think so. I think uh, I think some something stupid's going to happen. Whether it's either a radar error or a politician that's on his final legs, like Putin, who's dying of whatever liver disease he has. Uh, I think things are gonna get worse before they get better and i think the war is gonna involve nuclear armaments there's there's actually a biblical precedence for it and i think it comes from the old testament and it's a super creepy passage about like their armies will march against israel but they're they're they will be set aflame and their tongues will melt in their mouth before their bodies hit the ground and you're like, man, that's a very weirdly specific package or, or freaking prophecy. What is this nut job talking about? And it's like, well, that perfectly describes how a nuclear detonation works. Yeah, <laughs> dude, the Bible is fucking gnarly with some of its passages about war specifically. But like, like sin and war related passages are just so crazy sometimes. I love it. <laughs> it is. I hear you. Uh, yes, the book was called Armada. Thank you. Yes, that was the name Armada. of the book. It was really good. Back when I used to read in high school, I wish I still did that. <laughs> now readings for chumps. I listen to audiobooks. Yeah. Bro, Audible sponsor incoming? Maybe? <laughs> Anybody? Please? 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 They probably <laughs> pay well, please? <laughs> uh, sponsors love being begged. That's a good strategy. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, did, did you see the Adam and Eve sponsor I had on my most recent video? Oh, uh, no, I haven't, I haven't, uh, seen that yet. I think it would be, it, what was the dungeon lady, the dungeon yeah. mistress lady? Yeah, she worked. Yeah, I a... listen to, I listen to your streams while I'm at work and it would be super weird for me to have an erection while I'm <laughs> operating a, a CNC machine. I don't, I don't want anything to get stuck in the, in the machinery. So I think I'm just going to keep that one for later. Well, I... <laughs> anyways, I fucking, I, the way I got that sponsorship was I was like, wait a minute. I know who could sponsor this video. So I couldn't find a business email. So I Mm -hmm. hit up their customer support. And I said, yo, I have a channel. I have a video on that channel. It's unlisted. Check out the video. If you want to sponsor it, tell me how much you'll pay. And Mm -hmm. it happened. And I was, (laughs) I got so lucky, dude. 
And it, it, they're really the guy who was my contact at Adam and Eve was really chill. Uh, so I, he approved it right away. Loved the video. You know, I'm super excited to to work with them again if I ever have something similar coming out. Oh yeah, congratulations! You're gonna you're at this rate you're gonna grow so fast you're gonna need a second Azil. <laughs> People have been telling me I should get like another person to help with interviews, but that's like the one thing that I love about this job. I hate the scheduling. I hate the editing. I hate waiting for stuff to upload. I hate taking business emails, but oh my goodness is the actual That's what you got the secretary here. for. Yeah. yeah so you yeah. can pawn the work off to the secretary. So yeah. I'm going to come in here one of these days for an interview and you're going to tell me there's going to be a whole film crew. <laughs> there's going to be like, stand here, sit here. We're going to redo this lighting, check this guy's audio. But, 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 but. That, that sounds pretty cool. Good for you, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been really nice to have a, a more structured, but less structure requiring kind of role in the job. Because mm-hmm. when I'm, when I'm here listening to things, and when I get to read the comments is when I fall in love with this job all over again. When I yeah. am captioning and then correcting captions, when someone has an accent, the auto captions oh. on Premiere Pro are fucking garbage. That is not my vibe. So right now, Roger. I have an editor, a like, captioner, like a secretary. Like Scottish people. Scottish people are garbage. Oh my Understood. God, dude. I had this guy who is like <laughs> Irish. I had an Irish guy come on uh-huh. like months ago. Uh, video's not up anymore, not for any bad reason. He just wanted it taken down for like privacy. But I didn't, uh, I didn't know they made a VR helmet that operates off potatoes. <laughs> there you go. There, there it is. But he like, I spent longer doing caption fixing, like twice as long mm-hmm. doing caption fixing as I did actually cutting the video together. It was ridiculous. That sucks. You, uh, you need how Joe Rogan has a Jamie. You need a Jamie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That would be incredible. It would be pretty helpful. funny. Yeah, it'd be funny during the interview process where you'd be a person off screen just checking his computer, Googling everything we say, going, that's not true. That's wrong. That's right. Like a fact checker while you do interviews. <laughs> Hire someone from Reuters. <laughs> That'd be amazing. I uh, I hear there's a lot of fact checkers at Twitter that are in need of work. Dude, did you see? Oh, no, I'm not. No, I'm not talking about Twitter. No, I'm not talking <laughs> not about Twitter. I'm not getting into that. Oh, I'm not... I gotcha. <sighs> Save us, Daddy Musk. <laughs> uh, rage. Rage beyond comprehension. Mm. Yeah. Azeal only fans when? I don't like that sentence. <laughs> You'll like it when you see the paycheck. I I get paid enough to not need an OnlyFans, and I'd like to keep it that way. If you want to support me, join the Patreon. You can get more stories. Nothing lewd. I was about to say, like, prostituting yourself for your body on OnlyFans for cash. Don't we all kind of do that? We working at Mr. McGillicuddy's Widget Factory. Aren't we all just kind of putting our bodies into the machine to get cash out of it? <laughs> yeah. And time. Primar- uh, excuse me. Primarily our time. I think I remember an article a long time ago, and it was uh, during the... During the peak of the pandemic, a lot of health workers decided, like, I'm going to start my more, I'm going to start an OnlyFans because this treats me way better. Oh, <laughs> I, there's more dignity to OnlyFans than being an essential worker. Oh my god, bro! Imagine if like OnlyFans had in health insurance, like salaries. Oh hell yeah! Well, there, yeah, there, there you my, go. My That's health insurance model. is the VA, so it just gives me a second opportunity to die for my country. Oh. <laughs> Damn. Uh, hey, that guy's starting to sound like a YPG militant for... Yeah, same dude. Same dude. Hello. It, it's him. <clears throat> Absolutely him who's getting a little hoarse, but yep, still me. I would actually love to get someone for streams that could, like, assist with stuff. Like, that could nope, be pretty Sunday cool. Money first. Yeah. You know what? I might just have my secretary come to my streams. Oh wait, no, she's in she's in freaking France, so her time zone is just like not not it for my stuff. Uh, why are we talking about OnlyFans? You just started watching. You know what? You know what? It's my channel. It's my goddamn channel. <laughs> I'll talk about my it's side like... hustle if I want to. <laughs> it's a joke. It's my channel. I'll. I'll take my basketball and I'll go home. <laughs> I, I I promise I don't have one. <laughs> Yet. Yeah. yeah. Wait. No. You heard me. No, I, I heard you. I absolutely <laughs> the heard you. That's going to put on a, 
How much money were you paid to put on a maid outfit? $269. There you go. There's your price. Everybody There's my price. price. There's my price. $269. Oh my God. I'm probably going to get like a really nice cosplay one too because I can afford it. And I'm like, if I'm getting a f- fucking maid dress, I'm not buying mm-hmm. some garbage thing on like some fast fashion site. I've had enough experiences buying... with that. You were buying a professional Felix the Cat outfit, gosh. Absolutely. You heard it here first. If I'm getting a maid <laughs> outfit, I'm getting a good one. Absolutely. <laughs> what kind of stuff do I need assistance for for streams? Uh, mm. Someone who can like tell me if something's wrong with the stream would be especially good because I've had streams like glitch out in the past halfway through and it was super annoying. I'm not Eager. selling feet pics. Look, I have... <laughs> I have st- Ugh, hold on, you can't see it. Where's my, where's my chair? Hold on. Yeah, what's the point to... of having a full body tracking suit if you're not gonna oh. if you're not gonna show us your feet? Ah. You're dirty, disgusting. Really? Ow, <laughs> dude. Somebody forgot to stretch. Yeah. Somebody didn't eat his Wheaties this morning. Ow. Look at how physically demanding it is to be an online VR streamer. Someone clip that. <laughs> Derp. Yo, Vendar. Hello. Uh, how do I feel about I thought, missing the Battle of Curson? I was about to say, I thought I'd be the one getting damaged. Ah, my back hurts from carrying this dry-ass conversation. Damn! Oh! <laughs> uh, the Battle of Cur- Say it again? What battle? K-H-E-R-S-O-N. I don't know. I've never heard of it before. So there you go. Huh. Uh, I was about to say, that must be a Ukrainian battle then. If anything, I, I feel bad about missing the, uh, the Siege of Mariupol. <laughs> If anything, yeah, I'm missing, I'm missing so much and it hurts. It sucks. Like going around and like doing these like foreign legion volunteer things is just the coolest. And to be kicked off the plane by a bunch of troglodytes going, I want more money. (laughs) Then uh, that's, yeah, that hurts, man. There's going to be a million battles I'm going to be missing out. But I, uh, I hope that the time I can spend here, I can use to arm myself up a little bit better and maybe get the appropriate licenses to join either the Ukrainian war or maybe the next war. Every five years, there's a new war. So yeah, it's okay. I'll hit the next one that comes around. When it drops. Hopefully it'll know, be in America drop. so I can not have to fly. Yeah, work from home. <laughs> <laughs> Finally! <laughs> a war where I can go eat at Taco Bell at the end of the day instead of freaking... As long as it's not bombed tr- out. And yeah. eh, there's nothing of value ta- in there. Yeah. I can eat at Taco Bell instead of a pierogi. <laughs> or nothing with the YPG. Bro, there was some... One of the stories that stuck with me most was the mm-hmm. was absolutely from our first recording was absolutely like the fact that the dogs were like eating bodies. That was fucking yeah. wild. Well, one of the ironies too is uh remember the during the beginning of the Ukrainian war when the conscripted Russians ro- lost supplies, they ran out of supplies, they were eating the dogs. Wow. Like you, you get food where you can because it's like the supply trucks got bombed out, they got bogged down and left there by the Russian government. And so you saw all these these photos of like dogs like the leftovers of what was cooked and what was like roped up to doors while they while they did their butcher work mm. and i'd yeah, do it too surprise, if I had like to. the I'd stream a... like the stream yeah yeah do I'd that. Eat a dog if i had to you'd eat a dog yeah you know what i'd eat a dog yeah. too i would eat a dog yeah. but it would have to be pretty bad for me to eat a dog but i would do, do you it. think there's different tastes for different breeds and if so what breed do you think is the most delicious? I think that was a bad sentence. <laughs> I think that's not an answer. And also the right answer is a corgi. <laughs> I think because it looks the most innocent, it must add to the flavor. <laughs> Why? There isn't a lot of meat on it. I mean, it's a small dog. <laughs> but oh it, uh, it's more about quality over quantity, right? Yeah, I guess so. Mama, Hi. One of my friends is in chat. Yo, hello. hello. Good to see you. I've had so many friends that we were like in the middle of talking about something and I couldn't respond to them in chat. Uh, now you can. Yeah, now I can. I saw Hurrah. Lee here <laughs> earlier. I saw Ven. I saw, let me see. Is there anyone else in here that I know? I'm just scrolling through pretty quick. So if I miss you, I'm sorry. Oh. Uh, do, 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 do. Dem, what's up? I know you. And that's all of them for the last like <laughs> half hour. But uh, let's see. What else have we got? Your uh, your little earrings are not manipulatable. 
it's a, fra- it's a shame. <laughs> I mean, my oh, hand passes they? right through them. They, they pay attention to your head, but my attempts to manipulate them have You might have interactions off. Wait, do I have interactions off? I want to make it so yeah, you can touch them. Uh, any other questions from the peanut gallery or any questions yourself? Let's see. Uh, oh, yes, Jello Kitty. I just met you today. I know you. Um, okay. Let's see. What do we got? Questions. Give me questions, everyone. I need questions. <laughs> yep. Again, uh, let's see. 19 Delta Cavalry Scout. I got amazing basic training stories of Fort Knox that are just hilarious. Oh, hell I yeah. Got, I got my time in the 101st Airborne Division, all sorts of intel stuff. Played around with the Navy SEALs. Joined a semi legitimate terrorist organization known as the YPG trying to get into Ukraine. Do you have any questions again concerning any of communications, electronics, engineering, automation, robotics, digital forensics, tool and die, and the manufacturing of basic things? Uh, questions concerning Christianity, uh, questions uh, which I guess today's topic was PTSD. What's your favorite color? <laughs> uh, what car do you drive? There you go. Wow, that sucks. That's a bad, <laughs> that's a sucky question. <laughs> You're killing me, Smalls. Can you imagine if like a space alien came down and it's like, oh, I have seen the moon worm. And you're like, cool. What's your favorite Pokemon? What car do I drive? <laughs> you're, I'm not even going to answer it. Okay, how about this one? This is a killing me, uh, weapons you're question. Killing me. Five five six or seven six two? Oh, uh, I personally have a, a seven six two by fifty one, or the NATO equivalent of a three oh eight. I, uh, I have an AR ten in the corner there. Uh, it is a Sig seven one six patrol that I got in with the Navy SEALs gun buyback thing. So I personally have a seven six two, but I've re- I assume you're referring to seven six two by thirty one, which is the AK forty seven round. Um, Ah, the correct answer is always whatever gun you can find the most ammunition for. Like, uh, when I was, uh, when I was in Syria, friggin', I got my AK-47 and it's fine because there's a million, everyone has an AK-47, which means if you need parts, you can find parts. If you need bullets, you can find bullets. I got a hold of an M16 and I had like three magazines. I don't know if I blew those magazines, if I was going to be able to find more. So I'm going to walk around with just yelling, bang, bang, bang a bunch. I love the M16 infinitely more than the AR platform, infinitely more than the AK platform, uh, because that's what I was trained on. But if you're not going to be able to find bullets for it, who cares how much you love it? How effective is it going to be to throw? That's going to be its uh, effective fighting distance. Yeah. Um, it, it's like It's like Fallout. Like, you know, when you play the Fallout games, like, you'll start with your, like, weak little plinking twenty two hunting rifle. And later in the game, you start finding, like, laser beam rifles and, and nuclear missile launchers and rocket launchers. And yet, even to the end of the game, you're still usually using your twenty two plinking rifle because you find ammo for it everywhere. And the game only has, like, three missiles. But well, you're going to waste it on the, the raider coming at you with the, with the mohawk and the little frickin' uh cyclops x-men glasses coming at you with a switch comb no, you're gonna waste your rocket on that you're gonna use your 22 life is like that too so whatever you whatever you're good with and whatever you can find the ammo for that's mm. that's my opinion on it yeah good question i like weapons questions there you go more weapons questions hi rev hi zoe and hi doge i know you three okay let's see what else have we got uh do 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 What's your favorite gun? Oh, what is my favorite gun? Jiminy Christmas. Um, you know, there's a lot of really cool guns out there. I like the MP5. I like a lot of the sub guns. Uh, there are ridiculous weapons out there, such as that stupid Haroon sniper rifle and whatnot. <clears throat> if I had to pick a favorite, there's a real Sophie's choice there. Every weapon serves a very specific purpose. But if you have to choose one, then you want the most versatile. And if you want the most versatile weapon, I think you're looking at an M4 carbine. You're looking at a kind of a stumpier, slightly stumpier M4 or AR-15. Because that's something that you can can clear rooms with it. Because you don't want to go into a room with a big old sniper rifle trying to clear a corner and anything like that. That's ridiculous. And I love my AR-10. It's going to be very effective in outdoors. But it's it's not going to be the thing you want to clear a house with. Mm -hmm. Uh, An M, a smaller AR... 15 platform is going to give you 
enough range to do what you need done. You're going to be able to, and you're going to be able to modify it, find parts for it. It's the practical, it's a practical choice. Right. Okay. My buddy just walked in the room. He says the Modus is the best one I've ever made. Modus. And then he said, fuck you, fight me. <laughs> the Modus? Yeah, the, uh, it's a big old machine gun. Ah, I see. I see. Uh, best knife you ever found? Best knife I ever? The only, the only cutlery I ever carried with me was a really sharp fork that I found. <laughs> <laughs> this knife I ever found was a spork, a combat tactical spork that weighs nothing that I can eat my food with. <laughs> Hell yeah. Boy, uh, that's knife. Here's Ooh. another uh, question <clears throat> comparing two things. 45 ACP or 9mm? 9mm all the way. I, uh, I respect 45 ACP in the Colt 1911, the 1911, which is, it's pretty like, it goes into other things too. Sure. But I mean, that thing did a lot of work back in the day, but again, you're, we mostly switched to nine because you can fit more bullets in there and it still gets the job done. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I uh, my first pistol uh, was, or I should more accurately say my first semi pistol was actually 45 ACP shooting those freaking bowling balls. I think it was a Kimber 1911 and I enjoyed it, but eh, what do I, if I'm going to, can I double stack up to 22 nine millimeters into my magazine? Or do I want my six 45 ACP bowling balls? It's not even a choice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Best war loot. Best. Oh man, that is a tough one. The best war loot I ever found. Hot damn. Um, things I brought with me. I got my, um, What's that stupid little rag that everybody... It's almost like a little do-rag that the Middle Easterners have. Yeah. A kefi? Yeah. There's another word for it, too. Schmock. Yeah, a kefi or schmock. That's a nice little thing. Uh, war loot. I really wish I got an ISIS flag, but unfortunately, the ISIS flag, I think Sergeant Avery took it. But later... Later, Avery died. He was... Uh, we called him Fat Marine. And Fat Marine was a hootenanny. Uh... He was, I think, did he have tattoos that were very offensive to Islam, or is that just you? Oh, that was just you. He had t-shirts saying infidel that were very offensive to Islam, while we're at the YPG, who is, again, mostly a lot of Islamic people. He, uh, he was kind of an in-your-face attitude kind of character, and he, I always thought, like, I made fun of him for being a fedora-tipping, neck-bearded atheist, uh friggin guy and he made fun of me for being a fundagelical christ cuck and <laughs> we uh we had a kindred friendship because i uh, had the wherewithal to bring a freaking solar panel with me to help him for, like charge his electronics and i liked having him around because there was always insects buzzing about but there was something about his sweat glands or blood type or whatever that was attracting all the bugs from me to him oh my so God. we had a great pair here he um he unfortunately died. He died to a VBIED or a vehicle-borne ex- improvised explosive device. From what I'm told, it was like a really up-armored one in the front window where they tried to plink the guy driving it at them, but they weren't able to take it down in time. Like freaking evil Thomas the Tank Engine coming at you, and it blew him up. And Jeez. now he's on the Shahid wall or the martyr wall, so to speak. Uh, his name was Avery, and he's a, he's a good guy. Mm. And he had the ISIS flag. That is quite a piece of memorabilia. And the yeah, thing right. is, yeah. either you get it on the battlefield or you really shouldn't have it in your house. <laughs> yeah, right. One of these two things are going to happen. It's okay if your grandfather has a Nazi flag, if he captured the Nazi flag. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, he didn't, if he bought it off of off of friggin' Amazon, you're going to have to have a talk with him. <laughs> yeah, maybe uh, it, it, an obsession with... An obsession with the story is fine. And like the story of how it was acquired an obsession with what it represents, probably a little less. Okay. Oh, it's okay. He's hanging the Nazi flag. Ironically. <laughs> it's just a joke. It's a joke. Don't get so the triggered. Walls, you, know? <laughs> you just took this from here to here. And I like it. <laughs> oh. Uh, oh, wait, wrong hand, wrong hand. There you go. Bob, thank you for the four ninety nine. What is the strangest weapon you found on the modern battlefield? 
What is the strangest weapon ever found on the bottom of modern battlefield? The Haroon was a really weird weapon because it was not meant to be a sniper rifle in the first place. And it was wonderfully impractical as a sniper rifle because you could not keep the scope on it connected for like more than nine shots. It would start flying off. So you weren't getting a whole lot on there. And it was just the concept that bigger is better, more bullet, more bullet. It kind of it kind of speaks to that caveman need. But mm-hmm. let's see. Did I find anything weirder than that? We, uh, yeah, that's right. We, okay, when we, uh, when we overtook the ISIS position, we consolidated some of the explosives they made, and they were making 3D printed grenades. Like, so ISIS, despite, like, living in a lot of caveman conditions, yeah, they were, I think that's happening in the Ukrainian war right now, too. People are 3D printing their grenades now. Like, you can make your own armaments. That's pretty crazy. It's not cartel... Yeah, it's not cartel levels of craziness where you see people making like the ones, the weapons coming out of Mexico that almost look like Final Fantasy weapons. They're like <laughs> gun blades with another gun on the end of that blade and it shoots blades. <laughs> what the hell am I even looking at here? This cartoonish ridiculousness. Uh, yeah, 3D printed grenades and the Haroon, I guess, was the most ridiculous stuff. <clears throat> and there was a whole the lot of printed grenades. Uh, they actually yep. like they do the damage that is necessary yeah, they, do, they do the damage just fine uh, they they put in what they need to to get the job done uh everything was always welded on like we had we had a lot of bulldozers that had welding and we had a lot of cranes that had welding and every armored transport was just kind of brought into a machine shop and just ramshackle cobbled together it's almost like um what was the game command and conquer generals of the gla the global liberation army where their tanks were just a bunch of cobbled together garbage they found on the battlefield hosted on and uh, some of the stuff like vehicle wise it looked like the mark haymeyer killdozer <laughs> it was crazy oh. oh my god the killdozer have you seen i'm guessing did you find about uh, uh, did you find out about that from absolute mad lads uh Let's see. I, I did uh, see the Mad Lads video, but I, there's also it's on Netflix. There's a whole documentary about Mark. Oh Kimmel. wow! I and it's it's a I think it's a good one because it gives a a kind of fair overview. Like, was this guy uh, screwed over by the city council and by those people in charge? And you get the interview from those people as well. Obviously, Mr. Haymeyer can't attest to why he did it, but like it seems a little bit more even handed. It is kind of an American underdog story of justice, and I think we want him to be in the fully right but i i would recommend the documentary huh uh let's see uh uh do 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 do. did you ever (laughs) steal anything from the ypg was there really private property among those guys oh you want to talk about stealing the white goddamn ypg yeah my roommate's laughing for a reason so my roommate had where do i even freaking begin with that my roommate had a lot of a two pairs of very good gloves and uh, like the kind of gloves where, you know, you can still keep a gr- your weapon on a grip. They keep your fingers warm. They keep them protected. They took three of those gloves, not four of those gloves out of his backpack. <laughs> and they, they took those. We had a lot of, uh, I'm not even sure if they were YPG members, but PKK members when we were at the PKK mountain camp that those kids had to be on drugs or something because when they were charging batteries, they would, they would be throwing them in the fire going, that's how you charge an alkaline battery. Like, Oh my God, uh-huh. they stole my, they stole the SSD card out of my GoPro. Cause I wanted to get like some cool footage and stuff like that. And they, they didn't take the whole GoPro. They just took the, the high gigabyte storage card out of it. And I'm not able to record anything for like the whole fricking deployment. You jagoon, so they could use it to go buy crack cocaine. They stole uh, my buddy's MP3 player that had a lot of the Beatles songs. Uh, frickin. And okay, those are annoyingly asinine. But the things that made it actually way more dangerous is they would steal your ammunition. <laughs> they would... Uh, and they would steal your guns sometimes because these are a bunch of annoying crackheaded little kids that don't understand the concept of personal property. And like we had a shotgun that we would be using for clearing rooms. And one night we, uh, we come, we become part of this kid, almost kid unit of way younger people. And one of the mother lovers stole the shotgun and it's like, and it became a bit of a fist fight about it. And because we didn't have any translator on our side, frickin', it becomes a bit of a scuffle and we get kicked out of the group because the translator's not on our side. Like, Oh, they're just whiny and they want chocolate and they're a bunch of dumb Americans. It's like, no mother trucker, you stole our weapon that we need to do our job. What's wrong with you? 
yeah, the YPG, there was a lot of theft stuff. And I don't even know if they, a lot of them understood the concept of theft due to the communal property kind of stuff. But yeah, okay, let me, let me take your boots. Those are my boots. Those are, commu- those are oppos. Those are our boots now. It, it, Frickin' Bugs Bunny communist mean our boots. <laughs> Why don't you go march around in the mud field? Uh, see what personal property, what the point of personal property is. How much do you think of it was them thinking of, you know, having their ultra communist mindset? And how much of it do you think was them being dumbass kids? I think it was like 80 to 90 percent being a bunch of dumbass kids. <laughs> <laughs> I almost wish you could get an actual like Kurdish YPG person on here because I'd like to dissect their mind, too. But I don't speak Kermunji, so I guess I'll never know. I mean, if you find a bilingual one or you have contacts that can get you one, dude. That would be amazing. Yeah, he would be he'd try VR and be like, what the fuck is this? Right. Uh, which, once again, is funny when the FBI starts pegging questions at you, going, what kind of super secret dark terrorist techniques did these evil guerrilla war fighters teach you? What kind of high tech communication screening are they using? And it's like, these kids were dropping batteries in the fire. <laughs> I, I don't think we maybe I have uh are you still there? Yep. Sorry, I'm you're just here. kind of fading out a little bit. Oh, that was a weird lag, but um <clears throat> one thing I'd like to communicate is like I'm not being racist when I describe the early Iraqi war, the early Afghans, and some of these guys in the Middle East as as a bunch of cavemen, and I'm trying to like hold one over them. I, I guess I should communicate the level of culture shock during the war on terror let me get a few examples here because it's it's almost like when the conquistadors went into south america and the aztecs or the incans or whoever was like interpreted those conquistadors riding on horses as one monster with made of metal plating like oh my god because they'd never seen a horse before it's almost like that we had uh we had stories and reports in the sipper net and in our intelligence thing and from our agents and the Ankadola stories from our, our soldiers and some of them of the following scenarios. They thought that our tanks had a force field because every time they fired an RPG at it at a glancing thing, it would blink off because it was a glancing blow that didn't hurt anything. And they thought they saw space force fields happening. So you had Iraqi militiamen who are wrapping their RPGs in tinfoil because they're like this. This will defeat the enemy force field. <laughs> we had um, we had a lot of guys that would actually wear, that were captured wearing tinfoil hats like, like a bunch of lunatics because they thought that American PSYOPs division were actually psychics. <laughs> that, that's <laughs> what the PSYOPs stood for. And the, the it would stop them from reading your mind. <laughs> oh my God. We had, um, we had a lot of terrorists trying to ambush our con our, our convoys, not to kill the people, but to steal the supplies and the supplies they wanted the most was Gatorade and rip fuel because they thought it was the magic super soldier serum that made all the Americans so buff. They thought (laughs) that the Marines, when they first encountered them were actual androids like robots because of the precise movements that they would do while pulling guard, like almost like the tomb of the unknown soldier. That's amazing. They thought, (laughs) God, I, it's so freaking crazy. Yeah. They thought that if you held button in on the AR, that it would make the bullets more powerful. Oh, yeah. The forward, the forward assist. Did you hear that or should I repeat that? Go ahead and repeat it. Oh, okay. The, uh, they thought that when they got a hold of an AR-15, uh, that the forward assist was actually the button to make the bullets go faster. <laughs> which uh, on an AR-15, is it's basically like your gun is jammed. So you... You apply sports, slap, pull, observe, release, tap, squeeze, and you tap on that forward assist to help assist the bullet into the chamber in in the issue of a jam. But they thought it's like, this is the magic bullet. This is going to make the bullets go faster. You had a lot of scenarios like this. They're like, oh, my God. Uh, Huh. Huh? Yep, they thought that the AK sight post was something you can adjust to make the bullet go longer, not something that helps you zero the bullet at a longer distance. <laughs> they, they didn't know anything about their damn guns, and it was incredibly frustrating 
because you wanted to teach them about their guns because these are the people that had your back. Like, you got to cover your sector of fire, I can cover my sector of fire, and if you don't, I'm going to get flanked and I'm going to get, like, shot in the neck. And we had those scenarios happen, and we had Westerners die because we had guerrilla war fighting YPG members that thought that it was just cool to be a guerrilla war fighter. Like, it's it's like being a gangster, yo. It's, it's, it's a sexy thing to be a guerrilla war fighter. It's about taking your selfies. It's not about learning how to fight and kill the enemy and protect your your comrades or your havals. Yeah. Uh, it's super, super frustrating. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of cultural clash and shock. I could probably think of a few others given the time. It's pretty funny. I got I got a lot of weird reports on my desk. I, I don't know if the the agent in Afghanistan was incredibly high, but somebody walked onto the military base to tell them the story about like, hey, you Americans, you pay for intelligence? I have an amazing report for you. In the mountains sleeps the dragon of this village, and in his mouth is a jewel which he breathes to light up the sun. But I know that if you get a German bomber, no, 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 if you get a B American B-52 bomber, you can blow up this dragon and take the jewel for yourself, and that the Germans will pay lots of money for it. And you're like, are you high? <laughs> are, <laughs> what is going on here? And the funny thing is I, uh, I edited it and I sent the report through, like whatever, the analysts will laugh at this. Uh, a week later, I get a report in my email box that somebody down at the Department of Defense who uh, is an anthropologist was like thanking me with tears in his eyes about this report because like this is demonstrating uh, how our culture has melded into their culture and like because they've been watching too many Indiana Jones movies and the effect <laughs> it's having on them and basically I think I just justified this anthropologist's job at the Department of Defense and that he made a whole career on that goddamn report given by a guy who must have been on like every piece of hash he could find that's amazing yeah uh, culture shock let's see what other questions we got <clears throat> uh ever come across looters in abandoned towns of course i know him he's me <laughs> <laughs> i don't i don't think i've expressed this enough i was a raider from fallout that's what it felt like like the the there's a lot of movies where the the good guys go into the village and they're greeted as the liberators. And like, thank you. You get like documentaries about executive outcomes, mercenaries liberating from the Hutu rebels or these rebels or that rebel forces. Uh, and the local African villagers dance around them and throw flower wreaths around them and stuff like that. And we would liberate a lot of these villages and these these ladies would come out covered in like blue tattoos they almost looked like they had just they just got done uh, mixing their cauldrons together i don't know what gypsy stuff was happening in north syria i'm not an anthropologist um but they would come to us and thank you liberator you have liberated us from isis uh we really hated uh, their funded mel funded jellical res regime that was really keeping us down. And I'm like, lady, I, if, I bet you play this game with everybody. I bet like <laughs> when, when ISIS liberated from Assad's forces, they're like, thank you, ISIS. We love Islam and we've been waiting for you. Flower wreath. And then we liberate the village from ISIS. And they would be like, thank you, YPG, for liberating us from those fundamentalists flower wreath and then turkey kills the ypg and comes into the village and it's like thank you turkish soldiers you liberate us from those crazy communists flower wreath so by the time you'd get in there you're like okay you don't really care whose flag happens to be folded over your building you know you got to give the local tithes to whatever jackass with a gun rolls through your village and you just want to live your life as a farming a uh, crazy witch lady. <laughs> and so by the time I'd run in, it'd be like, man, I'm hungry. I'm starving. I don't have a lot of supplies. We just took this village. Let's see what we can find. And they would come out, thank us liberators. And it's like, yeah, I wouldn't say we're liberating so much as under new management. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any food? <laughs> just sometimes rummage through stuff. Uh, yeah, I know some looters, all right. <laughs> uh, 
Let's see. Uh, questions, questions. We got so many. I'm looking for. Uh, people are calling some of the stuff oh. you've done like side quests. <laughs> Oh, uh, my roommate reminds me, and it is a very good opportunity to tell you about one of the Westerners who was the most infamous of us looting-wise. You ready for this story? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, we called all the Western volunteers, usually, uh, by their states. This particular gentleman was from Louisiana. He is a very cool dude. Uh, I enjoy him. He actually went up to Ukraine to fight. He was going to be one of our guys we are going to hang out with. He was, bar none, a kleptomaniac. <laughs> he stole everything that was not nailed down or on fire, whether he needed it or not. He was playing the game as if it was a LucasArts point-and-click adventure game where you shove everything in your inventory because you're going to need that for a puzzle later. So we would go into buildings and he was like, is that a pair of x-rays? I might need that. Yoink. Is that a is that a mortar and pestle? Oh, that might come in handy. Yoink. Is that a VHS tape of someone's wedding? My VHS tape now. It got so much where he couldn't carry it all. And the mother trucker found a hot dog stand at some point. And he was like, he was running around villages with a hot dog cart and putting everybody's stuff in it. And like, we're going to need this. I'm going to sell this stuff. <laughs> Friggin'. <laughs> He, um, I think it came to a climax during, while we were fighting, he had, uh, like, the kind of airport luggage on the little two wheels, and we were trying to get up a hill in a firefight, and he has his, his little luggage cart, and it's full of garbage, and, and sp cans of spam, and we, and we're like, dude, you gotta give it up. It was huh. the best episode of Hoarders that I guess nobody ever got to see. He was he was awesome. He was a hoot man. He was the quintessential looter. Huh. And it's uh it's really funny too because our when we'd go into a village and we're gonna be there for a long time, we would go throughout the village and make ourselves comfortable because it's like, dude, if I'm stuck in here in two months, I'm gonna get a nice chair. I'm gonna and so we'd go into people's houses, I like that chair, and we'd drag it to a different house, and I like that bed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so all of a sudden one house would have all the nicest stuff. And when we'd leave that village, the villagers would come back and there was like hell to pay because all of a sudden all their belongings are in this other guy's house and they would start fighting and accusing each other of stealing each other's stuff. And it's like, how do you know that's my chair? How do you know that's their family heirloom? We accidentally caused so much chaos in the aftermath that I could see why a lot of the village villagers did not like the YPG. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh, shit. I'm getting a little drink here. One second. Okay. Dip my arms. Uh, <laughs> okay. Add time. Add time. I'm thirsty. Go. I'm going horse. Me too. <clears throat> How's everyone doing in chat? What do you think? Any more questions for us for this legend and uh, me to read them? Yeah, I'm not. Uh, I'm not doing anything. Uh, my schedule's pet the cat. That's the only thing on my schedule today. Yeah. <clears throat> my kitty, kitties. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Ah, neck crank. So the original question here is: What's your my personal loadout? But I'm going to give you yeah. a better version. What's your personal loadout in a zombie apocalypse? Oh, hot damn. In a zombie apocalypse, that is a way different. Uh, really quick once over of my loadout. Uh, I am more of a drone operator now. Uh, so a good chunk of my <clears throat> my personal kit has to be dedicated to the electronics of keeping that drone up in the air. A lot of, a lot of chargers, uh, a lot of like radio equipment and stuff like that. So I'm pretty much walking around the battlefield like a goddamn circuit city. I, uh... I've got, you know, your basic loadout when it comes to ammunition and obviously a med kit and the important things. But and uh, on the top, uh, I think you've seen it in the picture. If you go to my video with the YPG and you go to the imager pictures that uh, that as you'll post it, you'll see one of those. It's a it's kind of a dual loadout where one eyeball is the night vision and the other eyeball is the FLIR thermal vision, which gives me like at first it gives you the weirdest headaches because you're dealing with two different optical things overlaid, but you get used to it after a while, and you're like, okay, this isn't quite as good, obviously, as the $60,000 DARPA overlaid border tracing 
super night vision with eight optics going nine optics going every which way that you always see the navy seals having but this is a pretty good discount version of that Mm -hmm. uh and the rest of it's yeah it's dedicated to the drone uh so yeah there's that for a zombie apocalypse holy moly uh oof i would recommend the book generation z or what is it gen not gen world war z World War Z, thank you so much. I, I got stuck because I that of annoying Brad Pitt movie that had no relation to the book. <laughs> the uh, the book itself was actually about like a documentary about how we the army failed to stop the zombie apocalypse, and it's because everybody had really high tech tack loadout and body armor and things that don't make sense to fight a horde of zombies when you had a very top heavy military uh due to the brass who didn't want to change things who had a lot of money flowing through the system so everybody's in the new warrior systems with cameras going every which way getting devoured by zombies (laughs) and it's hurting morale for everybody because it's being captured on camera and blared on a thousand tv screens all of your comrades getting eaten alive from the stupidest tactics you've ever seen and it's only till the end of the book that america gets its its stuff together and fights the zombies in a practical manner and i think what they found the best things were long pokey bits that'll destroy the brain so they had they were big uh, aficionados for crowbars and almost like gardening implements uh, like welded together where you just kind of you you keep light you do your cardio and you just kind of do a little stick action uh into the eye socket and do a little scrambly you don't waste too many you don't waste too much effort into each individual one <clears throat> i guess if i if i had to recommend anything for the zombie apocalypse loadout it would be a good dependable melee weapon uh i don't know a entrenching tool uh, or preferably something longer mm-hmm. good question zombie yeah, questions a- are always priority one yeah ever fired an rpg I have not personally fired an RPG, which is a shame. Let me tell you about the person we did give the wife the RPG to. She's about yay big. She was like three foot tall, and it was the most hilarious thing ever. <laughs> she was one of the YPJ ladies. She held the y- She held the RPG for the entire platoon, uh, which was terrifying because we only had one anti armor RPG, and it's always tanking on the ground, tink 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 tink, because it's being held by a three foot tall lady. Uh, and if, which we saw every day, a lot of ISIS armor in the background, moving from one field position to the other, we were incredibly vulnerable because if that, if that ISIS cobbled together tank came our way, I don't think that, that one lone anti-armor RPG was gonna, was gonna do anything, let alone fired by a person that I'm not sure I would trust her with. I think, I think we gave it to her as a practical joke. But I guess that's the jokes on us when we're dead. So yeah. uh, picture this: <clears throat> me and my buddy trying to make homemade explosives downrange because we knew that these tanks could, at any point in time, kill all of us. And so it's like, well, shiz, how do we handle a tank with the with the stuff that we have? Thermite. The answer is thermite. Thermites. It's just rust and aluminum powder, essentially. And it's like, I can make rust. <laughs> no matter where you are, you can make rust. We have some aluminum siding. Let's file this down and do the appropriate things we need to make thermite grenades in case this ISIS tank comes over. We had one file with no teeth. <laughs> it hurt so much. We spent like a day or two just trying to file down enough dust to do a little poof action. And we were unfortunately unsuccessful in creating our, our our thermal grenades because we just didn't have the equipment for it. Mm. Uh, and then I think later when we started taking positions, because someone up the chain of command finally got their act together, they started at least digging uh, tank berms, as in like they would dig trenches big enough or wide enough to where tanks would crash into, giving us some level of of protection even if it's not perfect yeah yeah i i never personally fired an rpg i hope to someday 
the only, unfortunately, the embarrassingly enough, the only rocket system that I've ever personally fired, it was the AT4 rocket launcher training module, <laughs> which if you get into the army, they don't want to let everybody fire an AT4 because it's way too expensive. Uh, so base, usually one or two people in the whole platoon get to fire the actual rocket and everybody else just gets a cool demonstration. <clears throat> And that was not me. Everybody else gets the one that just fires the dumb little like nine mil round tracer round or whatever the heck it is. Uh, it's funny because when you're the person firing that all day long in the summer, you're just starting brush fires. <laughs> so oh. one trainee would come out, fire his little like dumb tracer round. It would immediately start a brush fire. Everybody sit around in the heat in your body armor back to back shooting the shit, waiting for the fire department to put it out. All right, next on the line. <laughs> Uh, Good question. ISIS had <clears> armor. <throat> was someone's yes, question. Yes, ISIS had armor. I, I, ISIS had all of our stuff. Afghanistan wasn't the only war where we left behind all of our gear. <laughs> where right right now the Taliban has our Black Hawk helicopters. The Taliban has our MRAPs. The Taliban has our night vision gear. We did that in Iraq, like. 10 years prior or whatever the time frame is. So we left them a lot of very high-end armor. Uh, most of that stayed in the Iraq side of things, not in the Syria side of things. And secondly, a lot of them got wise that it was a really stupid idea to be in armor. Because coalition forces, if you're in the air, you love two things. You love bombing buildings and you love bombing vehicles. So there were very few uh, Taliban armor pieces and most of it was just a bunch of cobbled together, welded junk and troop transports, and everything else was a technical. But every once in a while, yeah, you did come across some armor, and you're like, holy cow, what are we going to do about this? Huh. Because you're just like, was it unexpected when it happened? Uh, when you start seeing ISIS armor? Uh, yeah, it was, because mostly, like, that's what a lot of war is, is just the doldrums, you're just sitting on a guard duty, nothing's happened, you're playing on your phone or whatever, and you're looking out, and all of a sudden, you see a turret head peek through over a building, going from left to right, and you're like, whoa, and you jump out of your seat, and you would go get all the YPJ, YPG people who are looking at you dumbfounded, like, what does this dumb Yankee want? <laughs> Another chocoholic BS thing here. And then the translator would come and he would explain, there is a tank, it is right there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, luckily we had co a lot of coalition forces on the radio who we could drop bombs onto the thing if, if necessary. But yeah, you would see it and you're like, I was not expecting that. You had to play around in a Russian APC. Yeah, we, uh, we were in a Russian APC at one point. We didn't get too far in it. No. Yeah, it was all about the technicals mostly. Toyota Hilux for life. <laughs> we're going to Hilux for life, dog. Gonna get a Hilux tattoo. Clee's gonna get her. Ta look at look at me. Look at me. My adorable little eyes. Hilux for life. Uh, have you ever seen, or used, or seen a flamethrower being used? Oh, I have. Ne I've never seen a flamethrower. Are flamethrowers no. still in use in actual combat? Uh, if if it is in use. One of the weird things about a flamethrower is it is an amazing tool for taking out caves, which you think, therefore, we would be using all the time in Afghanistan, because in Afghanistan is nothing but a long series of caves. Because what it does is it sucks up the oxygen from the area. <clears throat> and people either have to, if they're not lucky enough to have another hole, that they all of a sudden they got a vacuum and they got to go up there. Yeah. Uh, but to my knowledge, yeah, a lot of obviously flamethrowers are not acceptable in accordance with the uniform, not the law of land warfare, not the uniform code of military justice. Uh, have I seen one used anyway? No, I don't think so. Do you remember any flamethrowers? Nope. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, do I know a lot of people that are burnt? Yes. <laughs> uh, friggin' a lot of these bombs would drop, and what would be left? in the aftermath are all charred corpses i uh crispy frodo the uh i didn't i don't know if i ever killed anybody <laughs> i really don't because it's not like call of duty where like you you shoot people and it goes plink it goes plus 100 there's a screen at the end of it and it says your kd ratio or anything like that most of the time i would shoot at pot shots and they would shoot at me and every once in a while you would see a truck go by with a dead guy in the back or a guy that's bleeding out in the back. And you don't know, 
like Steve Urkel, did I do that? Mm-hmm. And the same thing is freaking. The other thing about that, too, is when you do get a kill, does it even count as yours anymore? Like, let's say I shoot at a guy and he bolts into a building because of that. And then a bomb drops on him. <laughs> Who got the kill? Yeah. <laughs> what is the delineation of responsibility on that? Is it the 100% the pilots? He's just a glorified bus driver flying nonchalantly miles and miles above the earth that just pushed a button. Is it the the bomb loaders? Is it mine for chasing him into the building? Is it the fisters that called the fire protocol on it? Uh, but I do remember doing that, and one of these one of these corpses looked like Elijah Woods. It looked like Frodo Baggins had been radicalized, and. <laughs> Like we flip them over and you do a death check. So you poke him a little bit like in the throat or the eyeball and make sure he's not faking it. Although that was ridiculous at the time because the dude was fully charred. He smelt like obviously burnt hair was pretty intense, but there's like a chemical to the bombs that we were using. I, I don't think it's a hellfire missile. I, it may have been thermobaric, which is that heat pressure kind of missile either way. It wasn't the shrapnel that killed these guys. It was the fire that killed these guys. And uh, we poked him with a stick. And we tried to bury him. And then I think he got dug up and eaten. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there was fire. There was no flamethrowers. Mm. Hey. What about vacuum bombs? Yeah, that's the thermobaric. That is the vacuum bomb. Okay. Uh, what causes the thermobaric uh, reaction in a lot of bombs is the aluminum powder. They have a very high... Once they reach a certain critical heat in the explosion, they go crazy, like hotter than the sun heat. And that's what creates the vacuum is now it's burnt off all the oxygen or or more accurately, the atmosphere in the area. And you're like, we never really consider this. But like if you created a hole in the ocean right there, all the ocean rushes in to fill that hole. We're under a canopy of air right now. And if you remove all the atmosphere by burning it super fast, super hot all the canopy falls and rushes in and that's what creates the vacuum. And that can pull people's lungs right out of their mouths. I've never observed anybody with their guts on the outside due to a vacuum. If their guts are on the outside, they've mostly been shredded where thermobaric weapons used. Maybe I can either confirm or deny. And that's not me being secret. That's me. I just don't know. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I, I saw a good one yeah, here. The Hellfire missile is that. Uh, do do do. That's what they equip the Apache attack helicopters with. I think the Russians use them a lot too. Terrifying. Boo. Closest you have been to an IED. Closest I've been to an IED. I tripped on one. <laughs> yeah, my roommate's laughing. Uh, don't judge me. I was tired and I was hungry and I hadn't eaten for a while. And we walked into a village, and it's not like it was a really clever booby trap by any stretch of the imagination, because it was an IED meant for a vehicle. It was so obvious and big. It was a it was a big line of wire stretching out over I don't know like four or five parking spaces worth of terrain, and I'm just like the zombie walking around, and I get my foot not quite caught. I'm like almost there. When one of the YPJ ladies yell at me going, stop, stop, stop. Do you, do you know the Kermunji for stop? Yeah. I remember Zoot was go. Yeah. As Fem Neckham either. Uh, either way, friggin' she yells at me to stop. And I'm like, what's this lady's problem? And right there, I'd have to say, I don't know, four or five inches away. And I'd taken two more steps or three more steps. I don't know how much pressure it would have taken to trigger it. But there you go. It was four or five inches away, two steps away from possibly detonating a very large IED meant for a vehicle. I don't think it was an EFP. I, I think that's probably too advanced for the ISIS that we were fighting in the area. But yeah, yeah I've been pretty close to IEDs. Jesus. Uh, any <laughs> gas attacks? No gas attacks. Negativatory. Uh Funny enough, one of my best friends in the army was a nuclear chemical biological specialist or in NBC, NCB. I forget how the acronym is NBC. Okay. It's NBC 
a uh, nuclear biological chemical guy. And you, these guys almost never get to see anything. They get, they get into the unit and they spend their whole lives cleaning gas masks. And they love doing training where it, they pretty much have a crack house out in the middle of the, the fields in the middle of nowhere in a forest where some dude's dropping like their, their tear gas into or CS gas into. And you do a training exercise where you go in there. Those are fun stories, basic training stories and whatnot. But in the field, they just tend to be individual augmentees that are just like, yeah, they're trained in NBC, but it never comes across. So they kind of do other things. I got a report this one time on my desk in division about somebody that was putting like, I want to say chili powder on IEDs, <laughs> like something incredibly stupid. So that when the IED went off, it would also burn the eyes. Like it would be like, oh, they're not going to be able to stand some chili powder. And because of this, I got that report like, oh, my God, I know who's going to love this. And I went to my friend of the NBC report like, here, I got this declassified just for you. And he went to his commander like, look, we've justified our life. <laughs> yes, NBC <laughs> is back, baby. <laughs> it's like almost was like a party in the office. <laughs> they, they probably put that thing on the mantle. Somebody finally used a nuclear biological chemical attack. <laughs> uh God, I don't. I do not recall any the use of any gas kind of things. the The closest I've ever come to is mustard gas, which was accidentally made by a bunch of dumbass Boy Scouts when I worked at a Boy Scout camp. They mixed the cleaning supplies <laughs> in a way which produced mustard gas, <laughs> and they're just sitting there high off their nuts, freaking in a, a yellow cloud. And I'm like, go get the what's wrong with you? Oh uh, but on the battlefield, no. Uh, let's see. What else have we got? <clears throat> uh, do you play any tactical shooters? Do I play any tactical shooters? Uh, no, I, uh, I'm older. My ability to play first person shooters is bad. Like, first of all, I play on the PC and I play with a controller. So I'm already an idiot and I'm putting myself in an enormous disadvantage there. But I, I, I don't have like the twitchy thumbs I used to have as a kid. So when I get into like a lot of these shooters, I'll play as like Mercy in Overwatch because it requires no shooting, but I still get to participate. <laughs> uh, tactically, I can't wait to play Warhammer 40k Dark Tide at the end of this month. I got a graphics card for that. It's gonna be I'm gonna be super stoked. Uh, yeah, uh, I can't wait for the Emperor. Obviously, as a as a fun religious fanatic with a flamethrower. Um, one thing I will say for a lot of uh, you gamer heads out there is a lot of your skills in video games do not transfer over to the army the way you think. <laughs> we, uh, we get a lot of kids in basic training <clears throat> who have tens of thousands of hours in first-person shooters and tactical Rainbow Six this, that. And they can't reload because they've just been tapping the X button their whole life. And it's like, dude, you just, you just tap this little button on the side. You allow it to slam into here. And they're like, no, no, no. They can't shoot for anything. Even though they've been in the game shooting their whole life, they don't understand that there's no radar here and there's more than just pressing the button and it doesn't just magically juke, juke, juke come in. So sometimes you can do yourself a bit of a disservice with gaming. Go out to an actual shooting range sometime, just for fun. I mean, you're an American. It's your right. It's your privilege to, to train yourself in firearms. There you go. Uh, Good question. I like video game questions too. Let's see. <clears throat> What's the funniest shit your drill instructor did in boot camp? Oh my god. What's the funniest shit I've... Oh. Here's a hilarious one. And I don't even know if it's the top. But I can go on this forever. <clears throat> when I was in Fort Knox, Kentucky, as a 19 Delta Cavalry Scout trainee wannabe, I, um... We were cleaning the drill sergeant's office, and one of my friends picked up the drill sergeant's hat when he was out of the office and he pulled down his pants and he put the hat on his on his butt and he spread his butt cheeks and he went hey i'm the drill sergeant half right face front in reverse position as he jiggled his butt cheeks we took a polaroid of that we took we, no we took a film camera that you have to develop and we took photos of that and he mailed it home to his parents <laughs> and what his parents did was he? They developed the film and sent it back to basic training in an environment where the drill sergeant opens everybody's mail. So 
we're at mail call and the drill sergeant opens up this envelope and it's drill sergeant Olvera, this Haitian nightmare who's like six feet tall, all muscle with the heaviest accent. He's like, what the because <laughs> he sees his hat on this kid's butt cheeks. <laughs> as the most hilarious insult the most terrifying man in the universe <laughs> and so we spend the rest of the day at fort knox in the dead heat of summer in an uninsulated building putting on every piece of layered winter clothes like three layers of winter clothes and we're duck walked through the hallway that's where you put your hands on your head and you duck walk going whack 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 on your knees like almost like iron mics but you don't quite pick yourself up and so here's like 30 people duck walking in circles whack 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 and we're sweating so profusely that the the sweat is condensing on the walls and it starts raining indoors as a group punishment for the butt cheek photos that was a pretty funny one. Obviously, it wasn't funny at the time. Some uh, some injuries may have happened, maybe even my own. But yeah, that was that was a really funny one. I can give you another one, or we can just hit another question. Go What's for it. You? Oh shit! Another funny drill sergeant story. Drill sergeant over there. Always what if if you privates? Always what if this? What if the enemy does that? Well, what if grasshoppers had machine guns? Then the birds would not fuck with them. That was drill sergeant. Olvera. Uh funny things. I got smoked on 9-11. I'll tell that one. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'm in basic training. I'm 17 years old, and 9-11 happened while I was in basic training. It was uh we were doing first aid stuff like Eagle First Responder or whatever it was called. And we get pulled out of class, and drill sergeant, the drill sergeant's like privates. We have a very serious thing that has happened here. Listen, the Twin Towers in New York have been hit. The towers are on fire, and one of them has fallen down already. A missile seems to have hit the Pentagon, and there's another plane that has gone down in a field. We are under attack. We will be going to war. Do you have any questions at this time? And Private Gunther pulls his hand up, and he goes, Drill Sergeant, will this affect our mail in any way? Oh my God, Privates, you're so fucking selfish. And so <laughs> I'm going to smoke the shit out of you. Will this affect our mail? And so here we are on 9 11. And again, we're like, we're being pushed through fields of sand. You're forced to low crawl that day. One arm at it's all super low crawl where you're only able to pull your body weight, scraping your skin up against the sand <laughs> all day, hurting ourselves. I think uh, I think private private Tucker cracked a rib that day because of that stupidity. Yeah, group punishment pre 9-11 was some pretty serious stuff. I was in the army when we were in BDUs and jungle boots. That's a that's a little how old I am. <clears throat> huh. Yeah, that was funny as shit. <laughs> how much of a uh... good job, Gunther. How much change, whoa, how much, <clears throat> bro, I'm getting a list. How much changed mm -hmm. about the way you were trained once 9-11 happened? A complete 180, a complete 180. And it's really sad because I loved what the army was and I hated what the army became. Like I was ready to give the army my whole life. Like, oh, I'm a lifer person. Uh, the Pre-9-11 army was built to fight a conventional war against Russia. <clears throat> and it would consist of things like, we are going to do battle buddy drills. We are going to do bounding overwatches. We are going to, there was a bayonet course. There was, like, you would run through the bayonet course up a hill, uh, dive under razor wire, stab this frickin' uh, silhouette of a human, and frickin', like, Die, Ivan! I want to hear some motivation. I want to hear a primal scream. We had we had marches that were like blood, blood, bright red blood makes the makes the green grass grow. A yellow bird on a yellow hill. Uh, if you're in the military, you know what happens to the bird. You crush its head. It's great. It's about killing. <laughs> and our our um, what is it? Our combatives courses were awesome. 
we would just get together in a sand pit and wail on one another. Our, our sergeant at some point had used his own personal funds to buy us like cheap steak and he would pin it to dummies and they're like, you are going to go and you are going to rip this steak apart. And you are, that is what it feels like to rip a human. I'm going to duct tape oranges onto this thing and you're going to throw your thumbs into its greasy eye socket. I want to turn you into a killer. And then I got into other army post 9-11. It was like six or seven years later and all the gas just got taken out of it. Um, Frickin' the the Nick at Night didn't have the budget. Like, okay, Nick at Night is something where you have to prove yourself. It's like a little trial by fire in basic training where you dive under razor wire, and they're supposed to shoot machine live machine gun rounds over your head. And the first time I went through it, they had they had the machine guns going and the tracers firing, and they're blaring like Vietnam music over the loudspeakers mixed with screens, and you got. You got it, train trainers chucking quarter sticks of dynamite into the area to see if you freak out and get up and immediately die. And next basic training in 2007 was all like, we don't have the budget for this. We're just going to sit down and we're going to watch a PowerPoint about this. We can't really do combatives. Like combatives was like a, a two hour course. And what did we end up doing instead? rape prevention training, sexual harassment prevention training, equal opportunity training, don't be racist, don't be sexist, don't be this, don't be that, information assurance awareness training. It was a bunch of lawyers and businessmen running the army now. It used to be warriors, and then it became a bunch of businesses. And that keeps me up at night. Because that's like a family member that died. That mm. hurts, man. Thanks for the question. <laughs> oh, that was you. Thanks for the question. Come here. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, there was a huge difference, man. Night and day, by far. It was it was incredibly risk averse. Even your uh, even your enlisted people were very risk averse at that point. Like uh, I remember one drill sergeant and it was pretty much like. Don't lean up against that pole. That can be an IED and you'll die. When you exit your vehicle, watch out for the rocks. That could be an IED and you could die. There's a lot of people that got in the military with that fucking mindset. And you're like, dude, you should be selling insurance. I don't know what you're doing here. <laughs> if you're going to freak out about every little thing and you're not prepared to kill and die, I, I wish you a good life. Don't be in the military. Right. Eh, you're killing me, Smalls. Uh, what is the modern equivalent of Calvary? Oh, the modern equivalent of cavalry? Yeah, that is a that's a good one. I uh I fear that like cavalry was obviously a little outdated in a sense, because no one's going around in horses anymore. Uh but it's I almost hesitate to say cavalry has its own special place, other than the fact that it's really cool to get Stetson, like their class A uniform gets a Stetson hat, and you get a you get a cavalry saber in your uniform, and you get the spurs. Shut up, <laughs> you're jealous. <laughs> But, I mean, ca the point of cavalry used to be you were assigned with a tank and you became what was called more of a hunter-killer team. Like, there are two parts. You, you either scout ahead of the battlefield, and I chose the MOS because I thought it was the coolest thing ever. You scout ahead of the battlefield, you're behind enemy lines, you set up observation posts, you report back what you see. Uh, you're always going to be seeing combat. If you're not seeing anything, you're not a scout. Uh, and it was obviously a... a way to go into special forces and rangers and all the other cool addendums that you can that you can go into the combat arms and the other thing other than scouting in forests and setting up observation posts is you would become part of a hunter killer team with a tank as in you're ahead of the line in the crazy little low armored humvee or at the time in 2001 the bradley god help you and behind you is the m1 abrams and you're calling and coordinating fire with that abrams who can fire way further than the, at the time they could see <laughs> but Due to technology, uh, we could see things via satellite. We could see a few things via drones. We don't really need uh, a lot of scouts. They kind of became obsolete in that sense. And they're more nowadays, more like it, there's a bleed over between a cavalry scout and a mechanized infantryman. There's a heavy bleed over between the two. So it's kind of like yeah. as technology gets closer together in those two classes, sort of, 
it, they meld into one. Yeah. Correct them under. And I'm sure any infantryman will hate you and will punch you for saying you're just you're pretty much a mech, you're an unmechanized cavalry scout. <laughs> and every cavalry scout, like they, uh, there, there's there's hatred between the two. But I, I guess I never. I was one week away from graduation. I flunked out, so I cannot attest to being in any way, shape, or form a cavalry scout. Although on uh, the great irony is, had I been able to get to Ukraine, that I was trained in 2001 to fight the Russians as a scout, and then that never came to pass, and we did the big war on terror, now here I would be in 2022 fighting the Russians as a scout with my drone doing forward observation. They're like, oh, well, I guess there's a bit of poetry to life. I guess I ended up <laughs> doing that after all. It just took two decades. Mm. Right. Okay, water break? Yes, please. I, I love this. This is fun. I'm glad you're enjoying it. I was worried yeah. about starting with the trauma-related stuff because I was like, I hope I don't kill his mood right at the start. Yeah. Well, one thing you have to remember about trauma is that you make of it <laughs> you don't suffer from your trauma you're not a victim of your trauma but you make it to be what you need sometimes or you make out of it what you will and i hope it makes you you stronger in the end mm. if you could be batman be batman i'm batman what was Swear to me. christmas like did you were you there for christmas where for Christmas? Were in you, Syria? Were you in Syria? Oh, I should. I don't think so. I uh, I got there in the mud season. Like I, at the very tip of the end of winter, and it was spring, which was not lots of flowers and like Disney animals chirping out and singing nice songs. It was mud, 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 mud. <laughs> and I think I left before the worst of winter hit at that point. So, uh, yeah, I actually missed Christmas. Huh. Matt Christmas. Do, what is winter do, 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 like in the do. desert? Mm -hmm. I cannot attest to winter in the desert because I was not in Iraq during the desert, but I was in Afghanistan in the winter. And Afghanistan in the winter is very interesting because all the combat stops. It, it's, it's really weird because, I mean, if you think about it, these people don't have the... Ca their capabilities are in the emplacement of IEDs. But the ground gets so super hard, tink, 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 that you can't emplace IEDs anymore. You can't dig a hole. It's too cold. So they all kind of go home for the winter. And that's what's known in the war on terror as the fighting season in Afghanistan. And if it's a particularly warm winter, they'll, they'll, they'll keep going on. They'll keep going the distance. But the fighting season stops in the winter in Afghanistan. And we, uh, it doesn't stop us because we have good coats and we just ride around on helicopters anyway. So it's our opportunity to perhaps take some people down. But the other difference that happens is all the Taliban leadership, they go to Pakistan. They're like, fighting season's over. Uh, we're just going to go home. And their home is in the federally administered tribal areas of Pakistan. <laughs> and what they would keep there is just like their, uh, their little lieutenants and whatever. So all the fighting stops and you would just go crazy uh, in a far-flung base with nothing happening. <laughs> that, that tended to be winter. Huh. Uh, it didn't get too cold. Not too bad. That's good. I mean, I'm from I I, I hang around the Minnesota area, so all the ah. people that are like, "It's so cold." You know, you know nothing. <laughs> you know nothing, John Snow. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, people are asking MRE related questions. Like, favorite one? Have you ever had foreign? Oh, favorite MRE. Holy moly! I can tell you the worst MRE and the most notorious MRE. Go ahead, give it to me, roommate. What is it? We all know it. Vegetable cheese omelet. The notorious veggie cheese omelet, which has made many, uh, many a soldier vomit their guts out. A lot of MREs are actually really good. I know people like cry and complain about them, but if you get it, they get the calories and they actually have a pretty good taste. I think they make them in Minnesota and the flavor scientists, whoever's in charge of the recipes, 90% of the time do a pretty darn good job. But something happened with veggie cheese omelet <laughs> <laughs> that... I don't know if it's spoiled during the making process of it. It was an inhuman Garbo MRE. Uh, that's the worst. If I had to choose the best MRE, shiz. Uh, I don't know. Uh, in, in military terms, there's something called, excuse my language, rat fucking the MRE. And rat effing the MRE is where you just take what you want out of it. As in you get a whole like group of MREs and you're like, 
I'm hungry. And you break them all open and you steal the Rolos and you steal the freaking Tootsie Rolls and you steal all the candy out of it and you binge on like the stuff you like. And then you just kind of push the MREs aside for someone else's <laughs> problem to be. <laughs> and so uh, there's a lot of rat efforts that are like, okay, I know this MRE has peanut butter or this one has the jam crackers or this one has the, this one has the lemon uh, bread that I like. And so if you get into a group of it, you'll rat F it and you'll piecemeal what you like. And personally, uh, I enjoy peanut butter cracker, uh, lemon bread, and I guess the ravioli wasn't too bad. Huh. My buddy recommends the jalapeno cheese spread because he's wrong. If we ever meet in person, you are absolutely, you got to choose some MREs for me to bring to do like a, a taste test. A taste test. I think you're going to be pooping for a while. <laughs> or more more succinctly, you're not going to be pooping for a while. And then you are going to be pooping for a while. Damn. It's, a, it's like a dietary wise, it is a solid brick that eventually comes out of you. I mean, does it give you what Oof. you need? It gives you what you need to keep fighting, which uh, I God wish I had L MREs when I was in Syria. Because, I mean, you told me during the recording you were going for anything that was there. Like, we we anything all heard the story of the ISIS much. floor candy. Yeah, I think you made it into a YouTube short. Yeah. Going to make any of these live actions into a YouTube short? Oh, this, this whole thing is going to get edited into a video, and then that's going to be turned oh. into a shit ton of shorts as well. Yeah, no, this is, like, Ooh. probably the most entertaining thing I've recorded ever. <laughs> it'll still get like 27 likes <laughs> oh, dude this... oh i can't wait for the yeah the uh the youtube comments for the videos are always just delightful the, the attitude you have to come at it with is the mega mind attitude of like oh your booze nourish me i'm quaking in my baby seal skin boots <laughs> <laughs> because there's nothing more toxic in life than a youtube comment section i try if to I'm moderate sure, it but like dude i refresh so and there's three new ones right I uh, I believe that if today I cured cancer and I made a YouTube video of it, giving the cure for free, all the comments would be like, why don't you cure it sooner? <laughs> oh, I bet you just cured cancer for money. I question your motives. Next comment, fake news. My uncle Bill Bob cured pancer, cancer with baked beans. They're like, <laughs> oh my God, they're, they're still pleasing it's these people. Wild, dude. I, I have had... Yeah, right? I, I think the ban list for people in my comment section is like hundreds of people long by now. Is maxed. I uh, I used to play Heroes of the Storm, which is a uh, Blizzard MOBA before they ditched it. And it's the angriest it's ever gotten me. It's one of the most toxic video games ever made by man. And I maximized the ban list. I like, if I had a bad game with a person, it'd like, block, 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 block. I think at 10,000, you actually reach like the max block allowance. Oh. <laughs> remember uh, to promote dumb. stuff oh absolutely i should promote stuff because there's 379 people 382 people watching buy the plushie they're coming out january to march and i am super mm. excited to get them out to everybody if you want to pre-order now you can help me pay for the production and then i won't be poor and i can pay my taxes and that's super fun uh yeah <laughs> do you have anything you want to promote do you have any social media that you'd like to have out there Oh, uh, no, I'm a, I'm a Gen X slash, like, older millennial. I don't know. I barely know how to operate this VR helmet. Here's <laughs> well, a thank question. Thank you. If Social I, media. Like I... <laughs> if I got you a, a YouTube channel mm. set up, if I, if I helped would you I set one it? up, would you use it? You know what? I might, I, I'd, I would stream games lazily at some point. So, yeah, that'd be appreciated. Here's one thing you might consider doing that I always love is the, all, all the, horrible political commentary stuff you get on youtube they'll always stop mid-conversation to promote their stuff it's the most hilarious thing it's like those darn democrats or those darn republicans really have it coming for them but no one else is coming for them birch gold go ahead and invest in birch gold today it's like can you imagine them segues to our conversation of you just like plugging freaking bose earbuds at me like mid-sentence you should get totally just rude about pure anarcho-capitalistic about it <laughs> It's ruthless. That time you killed your mom, that sounds pretty crazy. But you know what else is crazy? The price right now at Mattress City. <laughs> <laughs> uh, open an LLC and tax right off everything. I do tax right off everything. My PC, my headset, my trackers, all the headsets I buy for other people so they can be in these videos. Yeah, yeah it all gets written and, off. And I just don't pay taxes. So <laughs> Oh, that also works. How does that work? <laughs> Look at me in my Klee eyes. 
taxation is theft. <laughs> well, there you go. There's your answer. It's it, it's certainly an answer. Uh, yes, if he does set up a channel, I will absolutely make a comment like on the video or on this stream about it. We'll get that set up for sure. Uh, Thanks, buddy. Plushy is only thirty nine forty nine ninety nine. No, it's twenty nine ninety nine. I'm not. I like how the off. price keeps increasing up. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's twenty nine ninety nine plus shipping. I uh, my favorite is the the people that can't negotiate correctly when it comes to those, and they're like fifty nine ninety nine sold. No, sixty nine. Like, but it's already sold to you, sir. Eighty nine. <laughs> like, four dollars. <laughs> they're just all over the place. Dude, when I started doing sponsor segments, I didn't know how much to charge, and I I did like I got so little. For what I, th Oof. I've probably had companies that have mm -hmm. made ten times what they paid me off of a sponsor Whoops. segment. Yeah, <laughs> like well, the more you know, you, you yeah. learn the hard way. Yeah, like I tried to hit up some of my YouTube friends to be like, "How much should I charge?" But they were like, "Dude, I don't know." I, <laughs> I, it was business, business, numbers, numbers. Are they buying it? Yeah, uh, raid Shadow Legends. I got a raid sponsorship <laughs> contact once like a legit one I, and i was like i don't know <laughs> like i might I do it that there's a car in ukraine that like a technical with a machine gun that has the raid shadow legend sponsor logo on it. oh my god i cannot confirm or deny but i would love to see that car <laughs> air raid shadow legends it's just like right. a... i know people sponsor like the grenades that they drop on the drones and some people have scribbled like brought to you by raid shadow Legends. that's amazing <laughs> i can't wait for that i can't wait for historians to look at this a hundred years from now and explain that to their students because the ship posting generation gets to fight now and it's really funny <laughs> right i emailed raid shadow Legends to ask them if they would buy us our plane tickets any the any response uh i got some automated responses <laughs> my uh my roommate did you hear that or should i repeat it uh he said that you tried to get sponsored for your plane tickets by raid shadow legends correct there That's... you go and we uh we just did not receive uh a, an okay but Aww. darn it's worth a shot <laughs> damn yeah worth a shot oh my back dude i've been standing like in real life this whole time thankfully i'm on carpet so it's not too bad but there you go yeah you can get those uh, stress, nice, like, stress relief kind of carpets. They use that for the machinist jobs, like these nice mats that are extra cushy. Huh. Yeah, it might be worth looking into. Yeah. Help alleviate stress. Yes. Uh, let's see. We're at three and a half hours right now. Uh, mm -hmm. My stuff is starting to get low on battery. I'm not sure if we want to start mm -hmm. another segment or if we want to call it and then yep. come back another day. Entirely up to you, buddy. You can flip a coin for that one. Okay. We, yeah, so you know what? We've been going for three and a half hours. It's been really good. I'm already, this file is going to be held upload to Google Drive for editing. Oh my God. So we're going to call it for this one, but he is absolutely coming back. And next time he'll have his own channel to promote. So get excited for that. This will be a video eventually as well. It's going to be a hell of a project for my editor. Oh dear God. But yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I hope you all enjoyed. This was probably my favorite stream or recording I've ever done. That We went through so much. That was awesome. Hey -o. Yeah. All right. Uh, cool. I guess I will see you all next time, which will probably be tomorrow. Yeah, probably tomorrow. Uh, I will see Bye. you guys then, and if not, on Saturday. Okay. Bye, the everyone. The apocalypse is coming. Stockpile on weapons and golds. Don't trust your government. <laughs> Taxation is theft. The Jews faked the moon landing. <laughs> Spigs! Okay, bye.